Hello and welcome to Season 5 of the Fortnite Champion Series for Oceania, presented by the Australian Open. My name is Vandy and I'll be your host for today. I'm joined by analysts Fallout and Timmy. Fallout, it's great to be back and see old faces, especially familiar Vandy, ones for another year. it is great to be back with some Australian Open action. Of course, every single year it has been synonymous. The Australian Open, Fortnite with a great time. Last year, of course, the year before, seeing Musel, Laser Beam, Lachlan, and of course, Pete That's conducting it. so many celebrities was amazing. Big shot to the Australian Open. This time, it's all about the Fortnite Championship Series, which I'm so excited for our first week of qualifiers. Absolutely right. Couldn't have said it any better myself, but we've got a fresh face joining us as well. Timmy, congratulations. It's amazing to have your broadcast debut. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good, thank you. Um, pretty pretty nervous, but yeah, re ready to get rocking. I really enjoyed watching it, obviously, on stream last year, mm -hmm. and yeah, just really, really looking forward to getting into it. We're really, really happy to have your big brain. Aussie has been talking you up nonstop. So to have that big brain to break down the plays as they happen, cannot wait for it at all. But of course, no good tournament would be complete without a structural overview. So let's take you through exactly how these next five weeks are going to work. Fallout, can you please break this down for everyone at home? Of course, the format is brilliant. Some, some changes, of course, from last FNCS tournaments in terms of how things are gonna work. We're gonna have three weeks of qualifiers that are gonna have four rounds in each of them. The top 10 teams are gonna qualify from each qualifier to the semifinals. And then there's gonna be 102 teams that qualify from series points. So keep an eye on that. Consistency is going to be key. 30 teams from qualifiers in those semifinals. It's gonna be a two day semifinal where we're gonna see the top eight teams from each heat advance to the finals. And then we'll have an opportunity for a reboot round team to make it through and to qualify. So I'm excited for that reboot round last chance qualifier as well. That'll lead up to our grand finals where we'll have 32 teams from groups and heats, one team from the reboot round, That'll be a two-day series as well, where we will finally crown our FNCS Chapter 2 Season 5 champion. I cannot wait for the next month of action here in Chapter 2 and Season 5 of the FNCS in Oceania. I can't wait as well. And thank you for that nice little breakdown for everyone at home. Hopefully you can follow through. Otherwise, don't worry. We're going to be here for the next five weeks as Fallout already alluded to. So plenty of time to get you up to speed with what's happening. But let's talk about points because, of course, this is how we're going to be structuring and scoring everybody. Fallout already touched on consistency being key. But, Timmy, what exactly is the points breakdown going to look like for eliminations? But yeah, so what we're going to see here is, is a very top-heavy format. So if you look at the points there, what you'll see is 14 points all the way up to third. But then as soon as you hit third place, you get 20. Second, you get 25. And first is worth 30. So you get the victory Royale, you're getting 30 points. Another thing to note, two points per elim. Now, that's really significant, the reason being in round three, we saw 25 points per ER per Victory Royale. In this, we've got uh, 30. And in the qualifying stages, it was also one point per Elam. So one, uh, what we saw was one point uh, being worth 125th of a win. Now it's one, uh, one Elam being worth uh, 115th of a win. So hugely more uh, rewarding to players who want to play a little bit more aggressive for a couple kills but then also really, really rewarding for people who get into the top three. As I said, extremely top heavy, extremely re uh, rewarding for people who get into that top three. And if you get the, if you get the victory royale, even better. I love it. I mean, it's all about the victory royale, but like you said, don't discount those eliminations because at two points a pop, I mean, it can add up real quickly. Let's remind everybody though what we're playing for because we have an amazing prize pool put together, which Fallout, you said you'd be kind enough to take us through the exact breakdown. Of course. And listen, anything money, I can take anyone through. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's talk about the prize pool here. First place, $22,500. It's a $90,000 prize pool. One thing that's important to note about the prize pool, obviously it stems all the way to 15th place, but it's for the grand finals. Really, I love how Epic Games decided to make it such a high stakes kind of major feel by putting so much prize pool in the grand finals. So these qualifier heats today are simply just that. An opportunity to qualify through for the semifinals, then to qualify for the finals for your chance to play for this $90,000 prize pool. Also important to note, 
Prizing shown on screen is in US dollars, so that's even more in Australian dollars, a significant prize pool here for Oceania. Uh, dollary dues, I think you might see us calling it fallout. <laughs> so I have to remind you of that one. Even though it's in USD, it gets converted to dollary dues for the payout. But thank you for taking us through that. And like you said, $90,000 on the line, it's a lot of money, right? It could change uh, a lot of people, uh, like in terms of their lifestyle, because it's just so interesting. The money is great too, but I think a lot of it comes down to the prestige and then also being like, hey, I won this. But of course, we're in season five now. This is nothing like the Fortnite that we knew. Timmy, this is why we brought your big brain across. We want to know exactly what are the competitive changes that we're looking for? What will impact the game? Can you please just break it down for us? Yeah, sure. So I think the biggest thing uh, in comparison to last season that we're going to see is the removal of shockwaves. Now, shockwaves were really important to last season because what we saw was uh, a lot of changes in the uh, on who had height throughout the game. Nowadays, what we tend to see is the team that takes height at half-half tends to retain it right the way through in-game and then most likely end up in the top three, top two, something like that. So what we're going to see is people fighting for height a lot, um, a lot more. You're going to see a, a, top, a few top teams really aim for that, for height at half-half. And we're also going to see a lot of players look to play consistency through mid-ground. So we're going to see two yep. very different play styles. And from there, it's just going to be an all-out war. It's going to be great. Yeah. And the one thing I'd add to that, Vandy, is you know, Timmy hit the nail on the head. I think that means and lends itself to players that are experienced, players that maybe don't necessarily need to have the most ridiculous type of in-game skill. If they can shoot straight, if they can hold high ground, if they have the experience and know, know what it takes to great, gain high ground, to maintain high ground, they'll win. What we also see in the current meta as well is sometimes that high ground team gets focused and mm -hmm. maybe a sniper knock or something of the like, and then the team that actually is able to knock one or put some pressure on high ground can retake high ground. That's where you have a little bit of a mix up but it's not going to be necessarily getting high ground for free kind of like we saw with the shock waves and the rift fishes so i'm excited to see if, for that battle for high ground i know timmy there's a couple of teams that are going to be vying for that high ground here based on their experience i think yeah, so definitely. like like you said guys it's going to be really interesting to see exactly how this all plays out because of, of course on top of that as well we've got that elim scoring so in the back of my mind already australia well Oceania in general we're known for being very aggressive so it's all just leading itself to hopefully be kind of not so much about like, oh, we have to play for placements. It's like, okay, we need that high ground. We need that height. And then how are we going to get it? Well, we might have to skirmish a lot earlier. Don't know how that's going to go. But I'm glad that you mentioned teams to watch and players as well, because we asked all the talent to give us your predictions on who you think was going to come out on top of these qualifiers. So if we can go ahead and bring these up on screen, we can kind of start to talk through them and break it down. Why did you pick these players? Why, for instance, Timmy, why did you go for Speedy Squad? So again, like I said, we're going to see a lot of teams fighting for high ground at half-half, and I think that's going to lead to a few teams sort of griefing each other or upsetting each other. So I went for someone who I, th or I went for a team who I believe is going to be the most consistent mid-ground team in the, uh, in, in the tournament, and that's Speedy, Luda, and Mud. So we've got one of the most experienced players in the game, Speedy, and he's followed by two of the most cracked out mechanical young players in Looter and Muzz. And I think it's just going to make a brilliant team. Uh, they're going to be consistent, uh, they're going to, and they're going to make in-ground consistently. Um, and Timmy, I think you're absolutely insane because you're going against the GOAT himself in Jinx. I don't know how you can predict against Jinx and Worthy on one team. They are the winningest two players in Oceania history if you look at their overall performance in majors and, of course, cash cups and the like. They are so incredibly sharp. I had to go with the favorites coming to this one. I think you'd be crazy to go against Jinx, Worthy, and Alec. They're looking way too good. But you brought up a good point there. The fact that Speedy, Looter, and Muzz are the only team that's on this screen right now that'll play mid or low ground. The rest of the teams are... I believe are known for height. Talk to me about Aussie and MDS picks. Yeah, so Repulse's team and Sync's team, again, same as Jinx and, and Worthy this season, are looking to play for high ground. And I think we're going to see a lot of skirmishes for height at half-half. I really do. I think it's going to come down to who can secure it the most. Um, maybe a little bit of RNG involved. Um, but whoever fights for it and takes a half-half, I think it's going to be the team that takes it out of those three teams at the top there. I love it. I want to also kind of give some honorable mentions to a few Dark Horse teams as well. Jace Basil and Vortex, you got to put some respect on their name. Absolute W Kiers, who are known to box fight quite aggressively. Jake Rocks and Skits, I think, is another team to look out for. You got to put some respect on Brezzo's name. He, of course, is the reigning champion from the Australian Open last year, about a year ago. He's playing with Culture and Bridge, a little console slash controller god squad. Excited to see what they can do. And there's also a Southeast Asia team that qualified, Fizz, Toggle, and Zwitty. So a variety of teams that I think could make some noise as Dark Horse is on top of the, the big four that we all kind of labeled. And interestingly enough, Andy, all mm -hmm. of us picked different teams that was not on purpose. I think we uh, yes. just goes to show the competition we have here. I'm really glad that you mentioned that because that was what stuck out 
to me like a sore thumb. The fact that it's so close that each of you, each of the talent that we have here, uh, casters, Alice, you all picked a different squad to win. It just goes and shows me and others hopefully watching at home just how close that this is going to be and how close it's going to come down to in these final sort of um, skirmishes that do play out. But, I mean, any final thoughts, Alice, heading into this first match of the day? Yeah, in my eyes, I'm excited for the aggression of the Oceania region. Obviously, we talk about it often with Aussie Antics. Timmy, I know you mentioned it, but there's such a high skill gap, and the top-tier kind of elite players are so ridiculously mechanically gifted. They can put up really with any players from around the world, NA East, NA West, you name it. So I'm just excited to see that aggression in this high ELIM format. I think that means, much like typically see OCE have a lot more early game aggression. Statistically speaking, they're more likely to fight than other regions, especially NA East and EU. I think we're going to see that lend itself well with the high limb format we're gonna it's gonna make for some uh, exciting gameplay timmy anything that you're excited for no i completely back up everything you say i'm just really excited to get into the games and um yeah see what happens they'll definitely give us a better indication of how this day is going to play out but in the meantime i'm gonna hand it over to our casters to warm up the hot seat to warm up their mics for game number one of course your casters today will be aussie antics and monster take it away guys Hey, thank you so much, Vandy. Welcome, guys. Yes, this is the first official broadcast OCs ever had, and I'm so excited to be here. This is the region that started it all for me. I couldn't ask for more, and I'm partnered by my man himself, Monster D-Face. How you going, man? Hey, listen, you've joined me on NA for a long time, so I'm happy to be here in your backyard. <laughs> OCE official broadcast. It doesn't get better than this, and I know you're proud. The chat is blowing up, so this is going to be this is going to be an exciting day. It is. I'm so excited. And Australian Open too. The tournament that just brings so much attention to OCE every year. And it's pretty much the main spotlight that OCE players get. But usually a LAN event, usually solos. And last year had invited internationals. Now we get to, for the first time, just observe OCE against OCE in a team game mode setting and try to find some of those underrated players as well. We talked about in the pre-show your pick being Repulse. I know Repulse is insane. One of those players that has that big name internationally. Is that why you picked him or is there anything else they didn't touch on? Listen, he's done it in everyone's yard, right? He's been yeah. everywhere. He's proven that he can do this thing. But honestly, I picked him because that's the homie, man. Always showing <laughs> love on social media. And he's got the skill to back it up. Why not platform the man coming yeah. into FNCS when we got the opportunity to? But hey, Timmy alluded to this. These high ground teams are all here playing together. So, you know, it is still going to be a, a shakeup for OCE. Yeah, there's always going to be a shakeup. Again, that hyper aggression going for high ground, seeing what they can do with it. And it's our first time seeing this stack format play out with this scoring format too. They touched on in the beginning to eliminate two points per an elimination. But I mean, I think that's a big point. But for me, it's that top three monster. You're getting half the placement points for getting top three. You come fourth and you've missed out on half the placement points. But at fourth, you survived until what? Pretty much final rotating zone. That's ridiculous. Yeah, so, you know, in with these top placement heavy style formats, man, you will see teams that don't quote unquote get a victory. I'll potentially still take home the entire line share of what is going to be the FNCS. So, you know, just depending on how you play your games out, whoever's the most consistent, whoever has the most sound plan, those guys are going to be rewarded the most. But, you know, either way, high ground can win games. Low grounds will still ultimately win oh, tournaments. Yeah. We can't count out these eliminations. That's what OC is all about. Yeah, and again, we talked about the big brain Timmy in the intro. That's what he was talking about as well. That's why he picked Mubidi and Luda. He said that, look, they're the teams not going to be going for that big, crazy high ground contestion. They're going to be going for the mid ground, playing those consistent games, and hopefully getting like that top three at least a solid amount of times. He said top five, but I'm confident in them as well. I know we're going to get some jabs at him as well, trying to, you know, get a bit of the love out there for power too. It should be exciting to see. I think another team we have to talk about and we can't count out. If you're going to talk about people going aggressive for height, it's got to be Tui's team out of Hydro Dam, right? We've already seen all the other regions in the qualifiers. RPG is height king. Yeah, and if you've made it this far, then you've already secured, I'd say, the hard part, right? Yep. Out of the qualification round, get to these final stages, and now things are going to slow down. The pace is going to, you know, the atmosphere is going to change now. Things are going to intensify. If you got the RPG, you're a Tier 1 team. You have the yeah. utmost advantage now coming into this, especially the removal of the Storm Scout Sniper, right? That strategy, yeah. long gone. No one's going to be ahead of the meta unless you have that RPG. You're definitely going to have the meta loadout. 
Yeah, for sure. And like you talked about, you alluded on it there. He made it through the hard part, right? We have teams with the caliber of Zait, Saf, and Stretch not qualifying exactly. out of NA East because they've been dropping the Hydro Dam. It's not as easy as you think. Everyone knows the Rocket's strong. Ruckus also selling shotguns now as well, which a lot of people aren't talking about. Bandolier selling guaranteed shotguns. That area on the map gives you a stacked loadout guaranteed, but Tui's team has secured here. But another thing to note on when it comes to Tui's team, they've been a little bit tumultuous. They've been a little bit, you know, up and down. Tui's split with a couple of teams already this season so we'll have to see how their chemistry looks playing into it that's one of the main reasons why i didn't pick them for my prediction but they're looking really really strong but ultimately it's oce at the end of the day anything could happen right now we've had you know fncs is in the past the first true fncs being won by a completely unknown team we could see something like that today yeah, that's what I was going to say. These dark horse teams, man, you cannot count them out, right? They come up out of nowhere. They strike hard, especially in a region like OCE where the Elims are going to matter so much. And, and these early game, right, these early game battles, they're going to go down. We talk about teams that hold an ego. They will battle oh, every yeah. single draw spot. <laughs> and the way OCE works in particular, there's already rumors going around, right? Who yeah. needs to call right now when you can just rely on series points and get the extra prac in and all that kind of stuff. So there's going to be, I think we're going to see some narrative unfold oh, here, Ozzy, yeah. right? Like, Definitely. There's, there's good reason for it. Yeah, same thing. You touched on it there. Consistency, right? 400 players are going to make it into the semifinals for those qualifying heats out of OCE. That's quite a lot of players. A lot of these teams, I wouldn't even say it's an ego. It's just safe to assume they're going to make it. Even if you look at who made it today, i say one of the only big teams that really didn't make it was Fresh's team. Struggling a little bit. They played well yesterday. It was just a couple of unlucky 3-2-1 sprays that didn't go their way. A couple of headshot snipes in the mid game, and that was enough to derail it. But for the most part, OCE is going to have their top tier players players they're always going to be there it's just whether they actually make it through but i think our questions are going to be answered we're gearing up the battle bus is getting ready for oce's first ever game on the official broadcast we're going to kick it off and we kind of know where teams are going to go but we'll have to break it down with our first map preview and here we have it it's going to be a nice 50 50 split game one of six that's going to unfold here and oh my gosh, Ozzy, how are you feeling coming in right now? Because this is it. The world is getting loaded up and we got the nameplates. We see where everyone's going. We see the nameplates and it's looking like we pretty much expected for the most part. There's nothing crazy with the splits right now. What I am noticing right now is what looks like we've got at least more than one team. Yes, Remy in the top right now. And they're fighting out over the weather station. Important to note here, this team, Fizzle, Toggle, and Zwitty, they're actually the only team playing today that is actually a predominantly Middle East performing team. They qualify in 32nd they are not an oce based team they are playing on a heavy ping disadvantage but we're going to see what they can do against a very solid team right now they have triple dropped on top of remy and what looks like they've also got g502 king here who is spraz but their third is all the way down in caddy by the looks of it so this is a 2v3 but i think they have the advantage right now yeah without a doubt especially where king is positioned here he's got that nice little swing round teammate up above as well and you can see they're already working their way through that material to contain the advantage it's going to be a top down push but it seems like the ambush is already going on they're splitting up and they might be looking to set up a little prong attack here yeah it's going to be slowing down um, I mean, the low ground squad is not looking good for uh, for Viz and company. Yeah, it's not looking too great. They've kind of got pinned in there. And like I said, they know they're at the ping disadvantage. They got a bit of meds in there. Would have been nice if they found a medkit or some bandages. And this is a very scary team to go up against. Remy signed Fury. They're such a good player. Remy's been around for a very long time. Very, very mechanical player. Spraz as well being known for being one of the most mechanical, kind of smarter IGL players for a lot of teams out there. And he's looking to make his way into this fight right now. Sitting back with the harpoon, not too confident to get up on the walls, right? doesn't have the shotgun unfortunately there are four of them in the game right now can't get their hands on any and we have the mako squad here we have botland kuma and flues right now looking like they're trying to hold down cynical shots coming out here arrest is close we got arrest are uh, uh, holding out and this is where the sweaty sand spikes get really interesting they quite often split like this monster you get the east versus west same as you quite often get down in misty meadows not as clearly divided by the river but still kind of has that you get your half the loot i get mine and then we're gonna fight it out yeah, and that's how some of these drop spots play out, right? It's not a 50-50, I'm just going to get a weapon and take the battle drop spot. No, this is a drop that's going to take strategy. Unlike the, uh, the weather station, the weather station is the complete opposite. It's down to who can land best, get the weapon, and then secure it. And this is one of the first or very few times you see a squad actually get away as a full trio. So OCE, 
Not a single full trio has been wiped out already, and we've been well in over a minute. So this is not the normal. I feel like, and maybe that's to do with the fact it's being broadcasted. Who knows? I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, I don't know. It's gonna be interesting to see right now. They're pushing up right now if they can, if they're gonna try and get into this fight. And I don't know. There's gonna be a lot of egos on the line there. You have Remy's team disengaging from a team they know to be on a hundred ping, playing from a different region. Yeah. That's gonna sting a little bit, but at the same time, I like to see them drop the egos, realize that despite having what I would imagine is a fighting advantage as far as mechanics and just general skill goes, because it is their home turf, they knew they didn't have the loot advantage. They don't want to throw their game one. They're going to leave, and it's going to be interesting to see how they play game two. Are they going to all triple drop on the weather station again, or are they going to try and maybe find some more loot before they take that engagement? And that's what I'm saying. What I'm feeling right now is the like, I feel like everyone's just taking their time so, so slow, like, right? So like, even right here, there's another team walking into the Sweaty Sand squad and they're gonna back off little do they know, but look at how long these battles are taking. Not a full trio has been wiped out yet. And the minutes are still going on. Finally, now we'll probably see that first engagement happen oh. here. Toggle is popping off. Oh, oh no. my gosh, Ozzy, what is happening here? They might actually win this. We got the bounce back down. It's hard to figure out what's going on, but all I do know is Remy has fallen right now. Fizz has fallen but I don't know how this goes wow. and they do they go down the only contingent from another region which normally you can't talk about right like in case anyone at home is confused FNCS is region locked in the terms of service you can't play multiple regions they chose to play on OCE and a lot of people question them for it they're showing why here they've taken down Remy's team this is not a team that is unknown on OCE these are solid players and they have been bested in game one by the boys on Middle East yeah no doubt about it here though we're gonna hop over with Mako, the sweaty sand squad. And you can see this fight is still going on here. The gas station being held down by the three-man team, Kevin, Arrest, and Cynical. They had this side of the map originally, and they've decided to hunker down and stay here. I mean, listen, at the pace of which these games are going, Storm Surge is going to be a thing. These fights are gonna matter ever so more. You cannot be so passive, right? You have to get active. You got to get active right now because, yeah, if you draw it out for long, you're not going to have the loot anyway. Someone else is going to push. We can see the zone is pretty far away. Sweaty Sands rotates aren't too bad. You've got the boat. You've got vehicles around. You can really make it, but they don't have the best loot. Like, look what they're working with right now. I'm also looking at ammo. Just everything is dwindling right now. They need to make a move, but they're all scared. And that's what you're going to see the difference on OCE. Timmy touched on it in the intro. We have like a bit of a, a bit of a skill gap here in OCE. You've got those top teams that really just have the confidence to run through almost anyone in front of them. And that's what lends to that aggressive. And as you can see right now, that's exactly what you're seeing from Goeg and Zalka right now. Trying to push in here. We're on T with Anak. And never mind though, Goeg goes down. Zalka's already down. Looks like they might be able to wipe the whole team. I think this is a 1v1 situation. It is. Snae's backing up, has the minis, has the shotgun, has the SMG, steps around, oh. and unfortunately isn't able to make it work. The lever shotgun against lever shotgun isn't good enough. Anak wins this one and Goeg and Zalka are going to be saved here. I think they're going to pick up the reboots and the fight for weeping has hopefully been won but only just yeah and talk about the confidence to walk into all enemy builds there so he was definitely feeling it he knew he had the advantage didn't even give him the opportunity to get that mini off so well played for Arnok and company winning you know just the first little taste of what's gonna unfold here for the FNCS leadups but all right back with the Mako team Botlin Kuma Blue's looking down. These guys are still on defense. Cynical Kevin and the rest have not moved. The more pressure that comes in, though, we've already seen the gas canister come out. Now we're seeing the SMG fire come through. This means that that low ground team has to be running out of material. There's no way they can sustain all this pressure for this long. They have to fight back. They have to do something right now. They are just playing scared. And here we go. We see it right now. I was expecting this to happen. We have an OCE team rolling out of caddy corners to clean up this fight that broke down over the weather station. And there it is. Our Middle East contingent has fallen. They won the battle, but they did not win the war. Venice's team comes through with a cleanup. And that's what I think is three easy points, some good storm surge, and they'll be very happy happy with how their tournament's playing out right now and how Zwitty's team is choosing to play this one. Yeah, no doubt. Mako's still, though, putting this pressure down here. There's nothing that's going to come from it, not just yet. Now you can see the teammates also just backing them up. This Mako trio literally finding every angle. Now, though, the zone's going to determine whether or not they can stay here for much longer. He's going to go for a final peek, and it should be the exit strap, but he does have this med kit, so I don't know. There it is. Finally, they do make the call. Seems like everyone's going to go on and back out. That gas, oh. <laughs> the gas station team is not moving. Like, look, yeah. Kevin's holding on to med kits as well. He's got plenty of heals. You they, know, this is this is how they want to play their game. They've got the wide mess. They get the vehicle. There we go. That is a good way to signal the the disengage. But look 
Looks like they're deliberately trying to split up and take multiple vehicles. I think that's a truck still there. They are going to leave that one behind, leaving a little bit of rotation for their uh, counterparts. And interesting fight. This kind of one of those ones that did you win it? Did you not? Did any of you win it? Like, you know, everyone has their spawn beef. They have their counters, right? Oh, we went 4-0. We went 4-1. I think that's a 0-0. They're both making it out, but they're not going to make it much further. I have to imagine. And here it is. Your boys, Repulse, Forbes, and Tyrax pushing in on, again, the team I talked about out of Hydro Dam. This is Suns, Cork, and Tui. And Repulse's team is going to know, not only is this a team that's in front of the solid, they have the RPG. And if you get that in Repulse's hands, this is going to be terrifying for the rest of the lobby. And they're going for an all-out engagement. I love that these are teams that we were focusing on in the pre-discussion as well, in the pre-show. Tui's team in particular is the one that we knew was going to have the meta loadout, the advantage across the board. And not only that, he is capped out on rockets more or less here. 11 rockets in the tank. That is ridiculous. Repulse is going to have a tough time if they want to take this one out. And honestly, they're playing with fire right now, regardless of how good this trio is. Yeah, they're, it, it's again, there's a scary team right now. Repulse, Forbes, and Tyrax. You know Tyrax, kind of a new addition to this team. Repulse and Forbes have been playing together for a very long time. They showed what they can do last FNCS. Day two, they ran through the entire lobby. Had one of the best tears you've ever seen. Repulse trying to get that peak. He also has that epic charge shotgun, which is very, very valuable. An insane one. And we see the RPG come out now into play in the mid game. Everyone talks about using it end game, but in the mid game, it's pretty lethal. He has eight rockets still left. Suns, Tui, and Cork trying to hunker down here. They know who this is. They definitely know who this is. But we have another team showing up, Oatly, and that's going to be a bit of respite for Tui's team. This is going to help them because I don't think they want this fight. It's definitely Repulse's team that wants this. And with Oatly and Prizzy having eyes on this one and Raptor, they've got to be careful. This is four phenomenal teams very close together with Qualit moving their way in now too. Yeah, no doubt. This is like, hey, open up the cookie jar. You want a cookie? You're going to get in trouble if you grab one, though. So you do have to be careful here. That is just poison waiting to seep in. You do not want to take a fight. And you know what? Repulse, he, he, he gets me wrong. Okay, he says, hey, monster, you're wrong. Be quiet. We're going <laughs> to take this fight. Look, they're actually looking for it. Rafton and Oli are also hopping on in. Orbs and Repulse guys seem comfortable down there. You talked about it at the start. I've been on your home turf for a while, Monster. I had to learn NA. It's going to be time for you to learn OCE. Anytime you think they won't take a fight, there is a very, very good chance they are just about to take a fight as Repulse now trying to get in. You have never met a more confident player than Repulse, and this is why jumping and hit, but now he goes down. Repulse, the titan of this team, has fallen, and he's gone down with the loot as well. No, he hasn't. No, yes, he has. He's got the splashes. He had the floppers. He wasn't able to use them. Only has gone down as well now. Can they get the revive? Raptor just sticks it with one second to go. So Prizzy has to hold off the onslaught of Forbes right now and Tyrax trying to push into this one and what a steep fight. I talked about fights where nobody wins. I don't know if there's going to be a set winner out of here as Forbes gets another finish, but they're shambles now. Yeah, this team is in so much shambles, but I think Forbes might be able to get everything that he needs here. There's that trio looking in though here, Ozzy. This is looking super sketch and look, Repulse is walking his way down. Repulse is up. He had the flobbers. He had the splashes and here it is right now. Prizzy's low. If Repulse's team can finalize this one, if they can capitalize and finish off Prizzy, this will be a fight that was potentially worth it. I'm seeing it now. Forbes had the epic tack. Repulse had the epic charge. That is enough for this team to have the green light to go. Coming out of Misty, I've been talking about it a lot. The strength of the gold, having those upgrades constantly is so important for a fighting team like this. They have their two eliminations and they got the loot down here so repulse is going to go back to effective full health full shield so i question a monster but i guess it was worth it confidence paid off they won the fight yeah not only that they actually got that clutch pickup i can't believe they pulled that one off just in the nick of time shout out to fours man clutching up putting the team on his back for a moment there but hold up we have another messy messy battle and this might be a storm surge fight for wavy jace here basile and vortex Definitely looks like Vaseline Company needs to get something active just barely above the surge now. Yes, this is a fight for the tags. Nine players have to go down now, Ozzy. Yeah, nine players going to have to go down here for Storm Surge. And those players like Repulse who've aggroed are going to be able to get that one. But Bathan looking bad here on the low ground with Zedox. Sayo nearby and Vortex is trying to make something of this. Vortex, Basil, and Jace is one of those teams that you can't count out. I was so close to picking them as my prediction is just absolute dark horses to win this one. They run the low ground similar to what you're seeing Center do on NA East. It's what they're known for. And they do it so well right now. As you can see, they're fighting in the trenches here. Bathan being forced to back up, use the last big pot he has. Three minis and he's 245 above storm surge but he's running solo 
Yeah, no doubt. And in the feed, you saw Muzz pick one up as well, and so did Spy. So, you know, other players getting active around the map right now as the Storm Surge is also turning online here. Back with Tui's team. Suns, Quark, they're hanging out. They have managed to get away with that RPG and did not dig into the rockets as well. So, again, a couple rockets being expended here, but that's not too bad. They have plenty to play for endgame still. Yeah, and they're in a good part of zone here as well. And this is the zones they need to make work. That damage maybe wasn't so bad from that repulse push because with a zone like this, you always want to get first and second zone. But at the same time, we've seen so many teams struggle. Like an example I could think of, Monster, is Jack's team. We watched it during last FNCS. They performed worse when they got first zone down near Slurpee because they couldn't get their tag. Same thing could have happened to Tui's team here. Out of Hydro Dam, they're uncontested. They're down in the pits. They have to get up and get some a breath of fresh air to get some bit. Kind of repulse brought it to them. So now they get this zone. They're looking good. On the other side, the flip side of things, that long prolonged fight at Sweaty, proving that Team Mako here is struggling to rotate in and into a very, very bad team to rotate into. Fluxy, Radius, and Slayer have been very, very vocal on social media about their plans to uh, play a little bit aggressive in the qualifying rounds. So maybe not the team you want to base up underneath. Hey, man, I appreciate how nicely you put that, you know, for everyone. Just, just a little aggressive, you know. <laughs> Don't step on their territory. Stay back. The electric fences are up, all right? You touch it, you will be shocked. Mm -hmm. And they're not here to, you know, they're not here to mess around, to say the least. Here, though, Radius leading the vehicle drive through. Oh, man. Okay, a lot of lines of sight in front of them. They are going to be able to slip right on in underneath this base here. Listen, Hunter Haven, this is a very interesting end game, right? We talk about areas of interesting terrain right here, valleys, uh, uh, little crevices, right? And all these mountains and teams are already claiming all the power drop spots for Radius to go right through the middle here. That's a gutsy rotate, but it's got to be done. And it seems like they are going to get away with it for the most part. Yeah, and they have to set up on the edge. You talked about interesting terrain. They're pushed right up against what is kind of like that cluster of hills at the very far south side now of Hunter's Haven, trying to make their way through as Spy being held down here with Code Russian as well on the logo. They take down Fluxy, and unfortunately, this rotate maybe didn't work out for them. They rotated in with the car, which is such a very, very big audio cue. Shows everyone exactly where they are. Radius steps up right now, has the splashes so of Slayer and Radius can get together. They're looking healthy, but unfortunately, Fluxy has fallen. So maybe their aggression going to be put to a halt here, as it's so much harder to play aggressive as a duo. But if anyone can do it, Slayer and Radius, two phenomenal plays out of OCE. Slayer being a World Cup solo qualifier, and Radius just being Radius. He needs no introduction. Everyone's seen his content. They know how nuts he is mechanically. As Team Mako here may be kind of proving that the sweaty fight wasn't so bad. They're doing better than I would have given them credit for. Yeah, definitely. Managing to bounce back is very, very interesting considering how much time they spent there. They didn't have shields or anything coming out of there. So again, dependent on the refleshers. Just look at the map though, Ozzy. This is just an indicator that teams did not go for wide rotates at all. They white line their way right into the new zone, and now they are stacked on top of one another. That's why we're seeing all these interesting low ground angles coming out of Looter, Muzz, right, and Spoid here. Like, they have these angles to just open fire on teams, and look, even with the easy bouncer cross now, there's not a lot of players based up on the other side, and it, this is just all kinds of messy, even on the rotates now. All kinds of messy for sure. And I was just going to say, we had a little bit of the power on power action. Muzz and uh, Luda taking some shots down onto Worthy. Not sure what came unstuck there for our ex-FNCS champions. I saw Worthy alone there pinned underneath Brezzo's team. So something clearly gone astray there. I didn't see Jinx or Alec at all, as we now see them boxed up on top of DJ as well. A team that kind of performed and really surprised people yesterday. In round three, they came in at second place, really popping off and making a name for themselves. We see Brezzo, speaking of AO, our last AO champion getting $100,000 in the solo event, proving that Australia can match some of the international best when it comes to solo. He walked away with the big cash and he's here to do it now on the Australian Open broadcast as well. Different teammates he was used to playing with as well. Brezzo had a you know slight stint on console for a while there. Now he's playing with Culture, who's also come from console as well. And four points on the board, two eliminations. They're looking pretty good. Listen, and let's not forget, that was an international tournament. You kept harping on it, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think people understand the significance of the fact that there were some of the best players in the world that traveled across the world to go ahead and play against that, and Brezzo came out on top, Crazy. just proving that, hey, OCE, Australian players, definitely have the caliber of 
skill that it takes to be and hang amongst the wolves, right? With the best of the best. Here on the other side, Repulse God, someone who's literally done that same thing. Yep. Look at how many eliminations they have. <laughs> it looks like we're watching a different game of Fortnite now. From zone one to zone five, there has been a nonstop war. Look at the map. This is not something you typically see on an FNCS stage, but hey, OCE's on the map now. Broadcast time is on. The stage is here. The spotlight is on everyone. And Tui's got some serious pressure coming in. Yeah, Repulse with the 11 team eliminations on the board. That is 22 points. When a win's worth 30 and we're still only in fourth zone, that is ridiculous. Tui having to expend another one of those rockets like you talked about. They're a valuable commodity. With the only way to get an RPG in the current meta being guaranteed from the Hydro Dam, you don't get them from loot anymore. You don't get them from airdrops. Very few players are carrying rockets, so they are such a valuable commodity as they're dropping in the gas can. Here we go, we're gonna cause some damage. The explosion, they are 550 above, but his team down here on the low ground is struggling. I see Eshes fall, Ryze's team goes down here. This was against Ronan, Will, and Eshes, and I think they might be able to potentially get Eshes back up, but a big engagement on the low ground. The Tui's team is more than happy to fire down from above. Looks like they're gonna at least, uh, ease up, which is good because they do get Eshes back up. Will and Ronan still in this one, and we had Sorif, Sink, and Volks next to them, a team that obviously I picked to win today, who's been really really quiet in this early part of game one. Yeah, no doubt. And Looter also finds an Elam in the feed there. And look, this is a North pool for the half and half out. Everyone has to make that, that long trek rotate, especially if you were on that Eastern and Southern side. And look, the Southern team seems to be clashing against one another. Brezzo is down though, and he gets completely thirsted out the game. And that's due to, uh, partly due to the surge, right? He was under that number. And look, players are falling now. That's because they, they have to fight at that point. You have to. And we talked about it. Timmy said the team that pulls high ground on the half half has every advantage with the vaulting of the shockwaves. And that's what we're seeing right now. We have Spiker, Epic Pyro's team on the high ground, a team that I'm happy to admit I actually don't know that much about here. So interesting to see they get the high ground, whether they're going to be able to hold it from teams like this. Forbes just getting in right now. One of the most mechanical players in OCE, one of the controller players that doesn't even look like he's on controller oh with the speed gosh. of the mechanics. Forbes is just hooking in, jumping into boxes left, right, and center. Repulse coming in from behind as well with that epic charge shotgun. It's such a lethal combo. And very quickly, you can see why they have 11 eliminations on the board and they're quickly trying to make it 12 or more. Yeah, and I was just going to say, you know, it's ridiculous that he's going to take a fight with every heal in the book, in the inventory. <laughs> he's like, nah, I don't need heals. I'll get siphons. No worries. And he does just that. Doesn't even take a return fire shot. He was too quick and too nasty with the shots. And look, we're just going to continue to hop on and see the onslaught go down. Forbes is going to find Walker there. Of course, Repulse finishes it up. But look, that's their 12th elimination now, Ozzy. They're pushing the 20 <laughs> digit, right? If they can just make it to end game, they will literally possibly hit a 20 coming out of game one. And we talk about another duo trying to make big things happen. Slayer and Radius here, only one point on the board. That shows you just the discrepancy wow. between the limbs and place right now. And Luda, Speedy, and Muzz have the high ground. Something that, you know, Timmy didn't actually expect too much. Said they were going to play the mid ground, but any good team will take their chance on high ground if they have it. They're going to not take high High ground, it ends itself, and here they are. We talked in the pre-show about the three teams we picked being the high ground teams, and Muzz's team was going to take the mid, but no, they bested all of them for now. They've got a good layer. Speedy looks like he's leading the front side as Speedy does best. One of the older players in OCE, but definitely one of the smartest here on the front side. Muzz is sitting back, in my opinion, one of the most mechanically gifted players, not just in OCE, but in the world, who's going to see what he can do from the high ground, as we now have uh, Mako trying to do something down here with Cypher's team as well. See if they can just avoid the onslaught from high grounds. And that's the thing. This is just game number one of many more to go. And we're seeing a story unfold differently across the board. This high ground squad only has three eliminations compared to someone like Repost God who went with the W key fest. Who is going to walk away with the most amount of points when this is all over? That uh, victory royale, those top placements mean so, so much. And Ronan is doing a little bit of everything, right? Earning his way closer and closer to placement, but also picking up those elims. And that's a refresher as well for him. Like, completely capping him off. He's going to be able to get to squad me and get the split as well. So just looking so, so good here. And they are. They're inside that 12 teams alive. A Slayer pushing forward here if they can. Really eyes on that top three. We talked about you're only getting one point for every team that goes down until you get to that top three. And that's when everything kicks in. You get five, six, and five. 
I have ridiculous amounts of points right there for that top three on order. And Vortex going for the shake. I wonder if that was deliberate. Maybe he's trying to find out the solo on the low ground. Almost always, usually that's an accidental click. But here we have Tui, our RPG team, not being able to put it to use too much. He has Suns has gone down. Tui, see what they can push through. Trixie has gone down as well. Faulty's team has been kneecapped. His radius is still going. Doesn't need Slayer. Doesn't need Fluxy. He's trying to do big things for power on the low ground as Muzz is doing big things for power on the high ground. Yeah, and Muzz is still controlling it. They have so much material. There is no looking back. This is literally a cakewalk victory here. They are walking their way all the way through to the final instances, the big placement points where things just jump up. If you can break this into that top three, second place, first place, you're going to earn so many more points. It's like the Elims don't even matter if you can get that high ground coming into the position that they've done it. And that's what they're continuing to do, just easing their way through this end game now. He's in their way through it as there's some teams trying to power their way through it as we see them fall in the bottom left right now going down. We're getting three different teams are following right now. Luda's up on the high ground here. Radius down below and I just, I can't see Luda's team winning this. I don't like to bring the cast of curse out, but they've got the splashes there. I think they've also got some white meds as well. A lot of times in the meta right now, we didn't talk about this too much. Games are going to heal off. I don't know where the OC is. We have one minute, just a little bit over until this zone fully closes. It's going back through old builds, which is going to keep these players a lot healthier through this one. So if it goes down to a heal off, you need to think, does Muzz, Luna, and Speedy have the ability to win that from the high ground? Or as you're seeing Muzz do now, they're going to drop down as Will drops into the box. Ronan, Eshes, and Will are playing so well. Ronan has seven eliminations on the board. High ground wins games, but mid and low win tournaments because he is racking up the elims. Yeah, no doubt about it. And that's what we talk about. There's no cutting corners. And Muzz understands that he has to come down. He's oh. working his way down. 5-5 five, five gets put. 5 in the chest there. And he gets taken out. Muzz is also just hopping in here. Now they want a piece of the action, Ozzy. They want to come down. You can't lose all these points here. You will fall behind. The wins are just not oh going to be gosh, enough. But Rodin's digits. still going. He's still going. Rodin's still going. But it looks like they maybe stopped here. The stair goes on top of him. The mountain. And no, they're oh, under the stair. No. Rodin, his, his reign, his run is going to be ended by a misplaced stare, but 10 eliminations. We see Muzz, Luda, and Speedy coming out on top, showing why I hyped up Coach Timmy as the biggest brain in OCE, but is the placement enough? We talked about it. 30 points for the win, Monster, but that was so many eliminations. Repulse and Ronan's team, they were fragging out. Exactly just that, but Ronan's team in particular was even better. 14 as a, like as a team, as a trio, they picked a 14, 10 just on Ronan alone. What a, what a game. I think the Elims alone just allows them to overthrow best first place yeah. part of the doubt just with all the Elims. So ridiculous game for them. I think so. That's over 20 points for the eliminations and then over 20 points of placement as well. That is a massive first game. And I wonder how many players haven't been paying attention to this switch in the format. A lot of people haven't seen it. First FNCS broadcast for OC. First FNCS where we've seen different scoring through the rounds. Round three yesterday was your standard. 25 points for a win, one per elimination. This one has jumped up. And I think I think that's going to be the tale of today. I want to see what happened to Repulse's team. They had the limbs in the mid ground, but I think it fizzled out towards early end game. But man, OCE delivering on the aggression. Yeah, operating as a two-man squad there. You know, things went a little crazy at a moment there. But either way, we are going to have to send it over to the desk, right? Also, we got to have these guys break it all down and show us maybe, you know, their takes on all the action. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. As you said, crazy was a word thrown around by Monster. That's exactly how we felt. We were talking through the entire thing. But Timmy, I see a big smile there, and that's well earned. I mean, Speedy, Luda, Muzz, Ozzy already is praising that big brain, but you had it. You had the prediction. Yeah, well, I mean, they did it in the way that I wasn't expecting it to. So they, like I said, I thought they were going to play mid-ground for consistency, but I'm not too sure if, if anyone caught it uh, on the broadcast. But what they did when half-half popped, it pulled really far. And essentially, they just bounced it. They used the bounce pads, got ahead of zone, and they just cranked up for height, cranked some 90s, as you saw. But uh, as we go through here, what are you seeing here, Fallout, in the initial game? Nothing but madness is probably the one word to use. We talked about in the pre-game, in the pre-show, the aggression of the Oceania region for a variety of reasons. What, right? One, mechanic, the mechanical skill that they have in this region is ridiculous. Two, it's the skill gap and the differential from the top elite teams, the S tier to the A, B, or maybe C tier is such a high difference. So that's why you see a lot of teams play aggressive early. Really for uh, it was the Repulse and Forbes show. Tyrax, of course, got eliminated early, but Repulse and Forbes continued to slay out, continued to play highly aggressive, and it paid off for them.
Yeah, absolutely. And, and as we just watch this, some of these clips here, we see see the way that some some teams decided to go about managing their surge. We saw Repulse and Forbes just decide to get in and and, and look for for Elims early. Um, and we see that we actually saw that from quite a few teams. We see Raptor here getting in. We see Forbes jumping in as as you see quite often. Uh, but yeah, it, there's a lot of variety in, in OC, and it's one of one of my reasons is why it's my favourite region. There's there's so many ways that these people go about playing the game because there is such a gap in skill. Yeah, that is incredibly true. And I, I think what's been awesome to see is how these players can stack up against the rest of the world. It is fun to watch how good they are. And of course, watching them slay out in lobbies like this. But when you put them against top lobbies from the rest of the, the, rest of the world, it's obviously very, very impressive. And I think this is a good example of it. This is the point in the mid game where Tyrax did end up getting taken out. But the keying that came through from Repulse, Forbes, and Tyrax was ridiculous. Tyrax did, of course, get knocked. Repulse and Forbes cleaned up the rest. But they ended up with a significant, I believe, 10 plus elimination game game that got them quite a few points and keep in mind here too the reason we're seeing such aggression well it's the change in format it's the fact that we have two points awarded per elimination so a 10 plus elimination game will get you 20 plus points and that's obviously in addition to any placement you get yeah absolutely and again i talked about forbes getting in you can see it right there forbes really just getting in <laughs> looking to be aggressive here as he takes out zorka and scams team um, one, one thing that I think will be really impressive here as we watch this is we, like we're going to cut away here and we're going to see um, who's actually on high ground. We saw initially, um, I, can't, I yeah. don't know if you remember, we actually saw um, Bailey and Spiker on high, but then as soon as as soon as soon um, Half Half popped, we Ooh. saw um, Muzz, Speedy and Luda crank ahead and take height straight away. And we're seeing now some clips of people playing mid ground. What we're going to see, Basil, uh, Jace and Vortex, they, they love playing low ground, controlling space and getting kills um, as, as solos. And from there, it was just all out mayhem. We saw Ronan going off. 10 kills as a solo, 14, 14 Elims a, a, as a team. Absolutely ridiculous. They're just jumping in on people. Brilliant to watch. Yeah, we saw Ronan right there with five. So that goes to show how much he slayed out in late game. That's why we talk about it often. Make it to late game, especially if you're playing mid to low ground. You heard Ozzy say it, but mid ground, low ground wins championships. And that's why the fact that you can pop off and get go from five eliminations to 10 in that late game, that is what Ronan did so incredibly well. But in the end, high ground, of course, is gonna win you the game. And in this scenario, Speedy, Looter, and Muzz, they did it in a way that's not necessarily characteristic to how they play. Typically, they play low and mid ground, but Ozzy hit the nail on the head. If you have a chance to take high ground, if you're a top team, you're going to take that high ground. And the fact that they're able to pop a bouncer, crank some 90s, and take high ground in the mid game right there, and then they held on to it through the end. Well, they got them a first place finish, got them the 30 points from placement with the Victor Royale mm -hmm. on top of all the elimination points they got, Vandy. I'm glad you said that because let's take a look at the match standings. I know that we've talked a lot about how we've got placements kind of coming through, but we saw a lot of eliminations taking place. And like the casters were saying, maybe not everyone's aware of this format just yet. Maybe they were maybe taken back by how vicious we were once that 50-50 kind of popped. So it was just real interesting to see like the different play styles coming through. And I like, Timmy, as you said, our region has a lot to offer in sense of this. I mean, you know, with the other major regions, like with NA, with EU, but everyone's got their own different flavor, their own different play style. So I'm just wondering now in terms of how we're setting up for this first match, how things are really going to go from here, essentially, because of course, I feel like the first match almost always feels like a warm-up. Would you agree, Timmy? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a couple things that are really important to note. Firstly, we didn't see it on, on the broadcast, but we actually saw Worthy, Jinx, and Alec go down early. Um, we mm -hmm. saw Worthy getting taken out as a solo in I think it was second or third zone, which is really uncharacteristic. Usually they, they make it through the late game very consistently. They're a very, very consistent tree, and it's one of the reasons that um, I'm guessing Fallout decided to pick them as his, as his uh, eventual champions. But... <laughs> But one thing that I think is also really important to notice, Repulse, Forbes, and Tyrax will continue to play this way. It is just, it's mm. going to happen. They, they they got, I'm not, was it 10 Elims? Something like that? They're yeah. playing ab absolutely out of their minds. They're going to keep playing aggressive because as we load up the standings here, despite the fact that they that they ended up getting Elimed on, on first moving, they're actually going to be quite high up because of that two points per Elim uh, scoring system. Exactly right. Well, it sounds like the standings might be ready, so we'll see if we can get that graphic up. But I also do know that match two is going to be ready and underway as well. So let's go to the casters. Let's see where they're at. Because like I said, match two is underway. We're probably just going to jump straight into this one. And then we can always bring it back to the match standings after as well, because we've only been through match number one. Uh, Ozzy, Monster, you guys there? Because please take us away. 
We are here. We are more than excited to jump into game number two right now. We did miss the standings there, but I can run you through it. It's fine. Eliminations did come out on top. It was Will Ronan Eshes coming in first on 51 points. We have Muzz Looter and Speedy picking up the victory royale. They're coming in second on 38. And then you have Epic Pyro, Spiker FN, and Bailey FN on 34. That's your top three. Repulse team fell just short on fourth place. Monster, your picks up there. We currently have uh, a few picks up there. Mine, unfortunately, is not. Hey, man, listen, if Repulse and company continues to just dominate, walk through the way they are already, they will easily stay consistent, easily stay inside the, the conversation here. Let's not forget, they didn't even make in game. That was just based off their early game decision making to take those fights. But the difference from game one to game two, I feel like game one was just that those early jitters, right? They got it off. They shook it off. Now it's time to really get back into the action. This fight at Weather Station oh. should not have gone the way it went the last time. But it looks like already... Again, shield, the advantage is on Zuti and company, but they lost this same position before, as they lost in the same position before. Yeah, I've seen this all before, and I was wondering how they were going to handle it. But like I said, this is just going to be another typical situation of neither of these teams are ultimately going to win, though. This is a giant ego battle. And right now, they're fighting this one out. Pace, Remy, and Spraz are on the low ground here, but they're fighting over already such minimal loot, and they're doing it in such a way that it's dragging out for so long. It's not going to matter. You can already see that arrow on the top right, uh, top left of the minimap there. They're kind of lurking around the edges of this fight down in caddy corners. They're going to push up on this and take out whoever wins anyway, and you're walking away with with no lose, so I don't know if they need to fix the game plan, but I'm so surprised to see Zwitty, Fizz, and Toggle right now on top of this fight, controlling three of the best players in OCE on such a big ping discrepancy. Middle East seriously getting represented here. Yeah, no doubt about it. Making ME proud, but we're going to hop over to the opposite side of the map. Here's Craggy Cliffs. Vortex, Zedox already working with one another. Wavy Jace is there. Bathan looking to come in, and so is GLM Sayo. Like, all of a sudden, look, they're just looking for the angles here. They just want to choke point these guys out, hold them out, and hopefully get this freebie here. If they can, it's going to be a hard fight to play. Craggy, obviously, having the barrels inside this main building. It's got so many holds. Like you can see here, Zidox trying to control this one. You've got so many layers. You've got the roof. You've got the main restaurant area of Craggy. Sometimes you have fish sticks walking around in here. You can see the logo on the side of the front. But you can also hide out down here under the wharf. But hiding out, they can't. Jace falls here. A team that we saw doing so last game here. They are going to go down. Oh, pushing in right now. The GLM new signing, seeing what he can do, and Vortex falls. The entire team is wiped here. And right now, unfortunately, team that I said I could have potentially picked to do well here today, going down very early in game number two. And you're seeing some stereotypical aggression from OCE as fights are just breaking across the map. And here it is, creative build-off monster. They got enough to crank up, and that's what they're going to do. Hey, look at like season one, the three-way build off different angles, pronged attack here, making it look like a classic game of Fortnite. Fizz and Zuity, Yuji's Tago as well, all are going to have to jump down to the slow ground. They end up giving up the height. I can't believe it that they actually finally now get pushed back and I guess put in a place where they sort of should be, right? To players like Remy and company here on OCE, especially with the disadvantages that they have. But there's another problem. There's Caddy's corner stepping in now. Caddy corner is always going to be the problem here. You've seen so much on any east. You see the cat corner battle going down between Kazu and Code Genesis team. You don't normally the battle over weather station. It's usually like an add-on. Right? It's like it's got a few chests. It's got a bit of loot. You try to get it on top of something else in this area. Maybe the other builds on the other side of the mound. But right now, we've got six players fighting over what I'm pretty sure is about three or four chest spawns. Maybe six if you encounter this whole area on top of the mound. As Spraz is pushing back here and none of them can get a foothold. None of them can get an edge on this one. I think Caddy Court is letting them be like, hey, you guys do your thing. We'll come up there when one of you's done. Yeah, they definitely just backed up. I guess those shots from Remy were enough to do it. But no, Remy's going to get taken out here again. Gets taken out. Yuji's toggle is literally popping off every single time. Connecting when it matters most. And look, the return fire there from Toggle just puts good pressure onto Pace. Pace is not in a comfortable position to win this. This can go any which way. And finally, King does find his there. So it's a back and forth. He answers back here, Ozzy. 
He answers back right now. They find their way in. Spraz doing some damage and seeing what they can clean up out of this. And here we have a fight that we haven't seen. This is an interesting one right now. We have one of our teams, our second place team, copying Victory Al in game one in an early game engagement. But Luda with the legendary lever shotgun. That is going to be scary. And look at the meds as well. Three big pods, six minis and the splashes. Do they need them? Brezzo trying to push in our last AO champion. Seeing what they can do. Finds the angle on the backside. But Luda, Muzz and Speedy just showing such good team chemistry here just turning all barrels fighting as right now we have them cleaning up the fight and i'm pretty sure we see culture yep running in the distance muzzle looter and speedy showing they can handle the early game fights as well as the end game ones yeah and that wasn't just like any team that was a pretty pretty dominant team right there in brezzo and company right a champ in its own right here though hop no repost tyrax and forbes man they just love these early game battles for this time is going to be the first one to get tagged here. A little bit of a disadvantage. Going to have to pause and heal up. SPG's hopping in from the top, though, as Trixie is on the other side of the wall. Whoa, this is going back and forth now. This is going backwards and forwards, and this is a hard team right now. The SPG contingent right here, spray and pray game, and seeing if they can try and get some spray and maybe a little bit of praying because they've got a very aggressive, very scary team at their doorstep right now. Repulse trying to make their way up. We talked about a few of those teams that said they were just going to play aggressive today. For Repulse, one of the players that is so confident in his ability, knowing that he's going to make finals either way. He's going to try and run through this one. Repulse, toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Will Repulse actually lose to Trixie here? Potentially such a close fight, and he does. The 126 repulse can fall. Gods can bleed in this scenario right now as Trixie is pushing his way back outside the box. Forbes and Tyrax, though, are going to make their way up here. So I don't think Trixie is going to make it out. But honestly, gave him a run for their money. As I say that, Trixie really fighting back and finally falling. But took down repulse in the process right now. This fight at Caddy Corners and Weather Station is dragged out. So there's quite a few eyes still here. And not only that, we're seeing a repeat of Repulse falling. Game one, game two, the first to go down on the trio. He's being a bit of the weak link where normally he's the pillar. He's the foundation. He's the strength of that trio. So, it's, again, Repulse needs to get his head in the game here and not lose those engagements, especially that one. Interestingly, he had all advantage. He had every right to win that fight, the shield advantage walking into it, and the tags initially. But we're going to hop into another fight, Colossal Coliseum. This is a great place to take a battle because... You know, once you're inside, it's like you're in a, you're in a dome. You're in a mega dome. You're in a, a basically a trapped zone that the fights are going to be able to play out, and not many players are going to be able to third party your way in, right? They have to literally physically get into this area, which is a lot a lot of a risk, right, for for most, and they won't be making that commitment for the most part. I'm one to admit, gone down multiple times inside Coliseum, try to put up a wall and there's an archway, there's a statue. There is so many awkward positions and awkward builds in this area that makes me just never want to step foot in it because if someone has the experience of fighting in this area, they have a massive advantage over you knowing where builds can and cannot place. But this one kind of going down to outside on the edge of Coliseum as we see a very different zone to first game. First game, we had a far southwest zone. Now we have a far northeast as we have Tyrax and Forbes still at Caddy Corners. I think this has to have been a reboot play for Repulse potentially, but right now we have them on four eliminations combined, but they are so, so far from the next zone. Yeah, for sure. But four eliminations, you know, that's what they want. They want to take these fights regardless of the distance. Here though, we're going to jump back into the Salty Towers first that we've seen it here on the day. It seems like things are looking pretty good for Yonda and company, but Again, the HP, a bit of a disadvantage, just swinging on in from their rotates on the outskirts of the map. They will be able to heal off. It seems like is this Walker, Goji here, they're, they're just going to rotate on out. Yeah, that's going to try and get out if they can here. This is uh, Goeg Zalka, and I've actually been informed, my bad, I'm missing the start. I was like, who is this player? I was like, Arnak. I was like, Goeg and Zalka, insanely well-known. Who do they pick up? Some underrated player. No, it is scammed. Very, very well-known, very aggressive, solid controller player from OCE. So this is a very, very solid team. Goeg and Zalka, no, uh, no strangers to popping off in FNCS in the past, doing so insanely well as a duo during FNCS. So we'll see if Forbes repulse they do. They make the rotate. They're in retail but man, that cost them. They've got the med kit, potentially might need a campfire here as we have Remy and Pace, another team who has unfortunately feel, felt the wrath of a long, prolonged fight that didn't go their way, having to make such, I don't, I don't want to call it a dead side rotate monster. No one's here. This is just, <laughs> I don't think they made the choice to go this way. I think it's literally the only way they can get to zone. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt about it. It's the only way they're going to be able to get there. And at least they have, uh, you know, the boat to work with. 
Now, granted, it's not like the old one. It will run out of gasoline. They're going to be stuck out there eventually. So hopefully they get to get far up, uh, very deep into the new zone. Uh, jumping back into things, though. Look, now things are going to settle, right? Now the dust is starting to settle. Everyone's going to start basing on, pacing on down, and trying to find these good holds. Sayo, Zedox, and Banthan, they had high ground coming into half and half out in the previous zone. They took some fights, and, I mean, it didn't quite go their way at some point or another. It, it became somewhat of a tug of war. A lot of teams ended up trading hands before it was Muzz's team who ended up securing that high ground hold. So you don't want to make mistakes, right? Especially when you have those advantages that late in the rounds. Yeah, that late in the rounds is going to be pretty brutal right now. Is Repulse pushing up here? Hey, we don't need meds. Let's just take these guys. Let's eliminate them. But unfortunately for them, it is Speedy, Muzz, and Looter. And that is not the team that you want to try and get your refresh on. If you're Forbes right now, who has no shields, looks like they're handing some back over from Tyrax. But they are really playing this one shambles. And maybe they recognize it's a good team. Potentially the skins. I didn't see who's Speedy. Okay, they're wearing Aura. Not a, t a skin they're completely known for. I know Muzz is someone to always rep power. Always has the back blink on but never mind they're gonna push in regardless whether they know it's them or not and unfortunately this is what happens oce a region with crazy skill discrepancy but if you jump in on another good team they are going to take you down but speedy falls as well so potentially almost winning this one muzz and looter on the back foot right now seeing if they can make something out of this tyrax falls i believe repulse was still alive but this is taken as toll they've lost speedy they're near enough dirty dogs for a reboot but it's still going to be quite difficult to get off and man repulse really living up to his name you talked about it He's a player who's known internationally. Is this what you're expecting, Monster? I mean, I was expecting him to pop off, but not <laughs> like this. Not taking on the first place team. And unfortunately, Raptor does find RuPaul's that is rotate on out. So he's not going to survive. Damn. That's a full team wipe. So fourth place team down and out of the competition. We almost saw an exchange of hands for a second there with the first and fourth. But ultimately, it is the team that's not in the lead that goes down. Yeah, that's the one right now. We still have our first place team up there again. Just to remind you guys, if you are following from home, going into this game, we had Will, Ronan, and Ashes in first on 51, Muzz, Luder, and Speedy in second on 38, and then Epic, Pyro, Spike, FN, and Bailey, FN in third on 34 points right now. So pretty big big jump at the top there, and now with second place going down, Will, Ronan, and Ashes have the room to run away with this one. And yeah, we'll see it here. You see, you know, the rest is going to try and come off here. QC has to hold this. All here. No, the cancel on the pickup. So that's a whole extra 10 seconds now to get Lupius up. That's a bit of a misplay. You cannot be making misplays this far into the competition. You've made it this far. And now Aston and company see that. Yeah, they understand. They want to take advantage of the misplay here. And they're just walking their way all the way through. No heals up, but it still is a 3v3. Has to be careful. The shot's going to trade both sides. It's going to be good. Keys is going to fall. Their entire team gets wiped out now. HVT trio is down. Unfortunately for them right now, and a team that, you know, doing all right. They got three eliminations now, eight points on the boards. They got a few points in the first game, not unknown, but definitely stepping up things in this one when they're walking their way through. And I'm trying to think how this zone is going to play into Esh's Will, and Ronan's play style. They do drop retail row. They have it uncontested. So a zone on this east side of the map, not looking too bad, not too far north either. They really only had to kind of, you know, cover that mountain in the, in the, the dreaded Kami split areas. Everyone talks about an EU, that big area of the map near the bridge between Dirty Docks and Coliseum. It's a lot of open sight lines, but here we see it. We get our update. They made it. They're clean and unscathed. They're sitting on that same south side of zone, so they haven't rotated far from retail. They didn't want to take the early rotate into center. They wanted to set up on the edge, and that's most likely for their Storm Surge tags Are they as they are a team that's uncontested. Yeah, no doubt about it here, though, now. Spiker, Bailey... Pyro all looking out and about. You talk about some draw spots that are uncontested. That gives so much advantage. We already know this Fallout has mentioned time and time again about the fact that the drops that are, you know, being contested, being PvP'd out, you have such, such less chances to actually walk away with the entire crown, right? To be the king of the throne. You do have to, you know, play smart, be patient, and, you know, be decisive on how you want to take these battles at the draw spots because they will... Turn around and bite you later in the rounds. Usos, Mantis, and District, though, trying to just hide out here, vibe out, and they pull a pretty favorable zone for what it's worth. It's just a northern draw. Yeah, and a team that's been incredibly quiet, the team that, you know, I would have thought that we would all be talking and watching was obviously Alex and Worthy, a team that has a good drop, like you said, and I don't know if they were fought for it, I don't know if there was some other issue that was going on, but Jinx, Alec, and Worthy just having a very surprising first game here. We're going to see if maybe they can make something out of this one, 
as they dropped it off. It's a fantastic zone. For as long as they got out early to get their Storm Surf teams walking in, they've got a really good shot to try and win this one because they're going to have to make something big happen in game two. Not because they're going to need it for any reason. I have massive faith in them, but they're the team that has more of, like more pressure on them than any other team. You have Jinx, the only three times FNCS winner in the world, winning in every single game mode, including the last trio. So wow. there's a lot of pressure on them <laughs> right now to try and do something big out of this. You know, that's a big title to uphold. Yeah, and not only that, that first game that we watched unfold, Jinx's trio finishing with zero points, that's a first. That's the first mm -hmm. ever for them to not actually gain points in a game. So they're in very much unfamiliar territory. That's 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 a, uh, I feel like a lot of pressure. If it wasn't pressure already for you mm -hmm. to not earn any points in that game one, man, what a way to start your day off, right? You're on the wrong foot. Yeah, knowing there's teams out there right now that are already on over 50 is here we do our first sight of them. Jinx, Alec, and Worthy are in this one. And look at the loadout. They've got the one to do it. The sniper rifle. Haven't seen it come into too much into play right now, Monster. Again, we also had the back of house bringing us some stats, letting us know that, funnily enough, OC is actually the region with the lowest percentage of eliminations going down to sniper rifles. So, I mean, from what we've watched today, Timmy talked about it, Forbes just getting in boxes. They are very close to close engagements. They are very kind of aggressive fights. Snipers lend to more of that sitting back positioning you know safe placement but we see a sniper there that can swing things when it comes to end game so quickly yeah no doubt about it and i mean listen oc uses it the least like like so hey if, if you're holding it, it it doesn't mean it's uh any less deadly oh, in yeah. other regions it just means that you know these guys like to use their ar their gunfights and their triple heels for what it's worth the box fight style on the other side though osiris Talk about AR pressure. He's going to get beamed for peeking oh, yeah. out the cone for a little too long. It's going to cost him a bit, but nothing that's too offsetting now. And Look this at this. A, the surge. This, this is a big surge zone here. Aussie. This is a big surge zone right now. 300 above. They're looking good. They're still looking for their tags because they're worried about getting in on that first rotating zone as well. 60 two players alive going into this half half now so some players are definitely going to fall here right now as remy's team made it out of that weather station engagement i have no idea that coastal boat rotate might have to be one of the best ones i've seen as my prediction team you see the spray and pray gaming contingency there volks's team pushing forward as qualic goes down here so we've had some big teams be very quiet in game one and i'm truly expecting them to step up here right now i was going to say bathan's team first time seeing them if you're looking at dark horses that's a team that i have really high hopes for to make a name for themselves maybe not today but guaranteed this fncs they will do something big i can just feel it yeah no doubt about it here's that remy team like you mentioned when we last saw them they were on the boat moving on the outskirts and how did they manage to find all this shield extra health legendary weapons i don't know but i have to assume it's the leftovers from dirty docks dirty docks such a great great drop spot right and they were rotating right up the coast so it might have just worked out perfectly for them and also let's not forget the coast spawns loot so for them to bounce back that is that is great and that's why you know you got you got to really appreciate teams that take those smart rotates and work around the outskirts but let's talk about this now Aussie. what's more important is the half and half out zone and slaya has the high ground this is their opportunity now to swing back they only got 20 points coming into this right and they had the least amount of elims in that last game for what it was worth they just they were not popping off like some of the other teams and they're getting chopped out here the pressure's coming out right now we talked about it in the intro teams that aggressively play for heights or if looking up he was considering the bouncer he kept looking at the ground there i think that was going to be a bouncer height play but unfortunately we see either volks or sync make the call to stay down here if you're confused on who spg pengy is it's none other than volks coined the name due to the uh the stereotypical back bling the pengy is his name that he always users but it's radius's team holding the high grounds so that's two very scary teams that already have eyes on it i see jinx's team lurking nearby as well zone is going over the antenna right now that is massive one of the few structures in fortnite that is completely indestructible you cannot bring that thing down if they can base up on top of it you have the most secure high ground you could ever hope for yeah it's either that or the steamy stack without a doubt but Hey, if you get up there, you definitely are going to be untouchable for quite some time here, though. Muzz Looter says, hey, we don't need that high ground. We're going to work the low. They're going to continue to move on through. And it looks like Plus is going to find himself a nice little Elam right there. Already finally gets him a no. little something, a piece of the action. No. He's going to go with the riskiest, <laughs> the riskiest road. There. They all it do works. it. They make all it. All radius falls. Oh. No radius gets disconnected. He falls. He might have bounce pads, though. He's just going to crank his way up. The 90s is going to come out and see if radius can get up. I was going to talk about the zipline feature, but I thought, nah, no way they go for the zipline like in this 
current meta right now with how good players are these days. Everyone with ARs in the back pocket. I would have thought they would have got way more punished for that, but no. They get the high ground, they're anchored to this antenna, and the risky play works. You call it there, Monster. That, that is a risky one. Yeah, no doubt, and they do get to cut across here, though. Back with Jinx. Okay, so Jinx is officially in an end game. So from game one to game two, night and day, very big differences in how they're already looking to swing their way back. What can Jinx and company do here? Race is going to get beamed. That's Ooh. massive. And he's actually knocked. Now, Low Ground has the opportunity to actually That's get Volks. something going here. That right? was Volks. That was huge. That's their chance. That's Volks' team. And here they are. They come up for it. I oh. knew it. As soon as Volks gets a knock on high ground, he needs no more permission to go for high ground. They called off the high ground take before. And there's Volks going down right now. I think they've got Storm Surge active as well on them right now. It is definitely not Slayer's team. They're 1,500 above Sync Slayer. And they're around this one. Sorry, fighting for this too as well right now. They're up on the high ground. Slayer is going to fall off though. Muzz even going down to Storm as well here. And Will going down too. So we had our first and second place teams get into an engagement with each other to try and close this one out. And it does work out. Volks is going to secure the high ground. And I mean, not with much, but enough to go ahead and go ahead and take it. Here's Kazuki. Oh. Kazuki's going to get taken out in the low ground. It's big exchanges here. I'm seeing uh, Blue He's still on the feet. Alex still on the feet there as well. He finds Sayo. So, yes, the trades were good. And there it is. Here's Volk sitting out with Sorif. They have just enough, but no material for Sorif. They're going to have to hop down no matter what. We'll see. I think that's why they let Sync go down there. They didn't even try to go for the revive. It would have been risky, but they'll get at least those Siphon Mats, those 50 of each material type to maybe hold them up there. And this is what's dangerous right now to his team. Do they still have that rocket? Can they pressure it out? Because you, you touched on it. They're not looking good on material. They are single tapping right now. If they get drops, they're coming down, but they can stay up there. Top five now. You're looking for that top three. That's when the big placement comes in as Bath in a team that I said, I hope to see something big from this FNCS on the low ground. Tui trying to control this as well right now. No. Cork is there. Tui falls, but they've got seven eliminations total as Sorif has managed to hold this. My pick can potentially do it here as the laser comes out. Sorif having so much time spent when it comes to aim training, known to have some of the most deadly aim in OCE and proving it right there. And look at that. A favorable zone gives them the five crucial seconds to pop the big pot as well. This is it. You already know they're going to be hopping down here shortly. Soon to knock on the doors of what's left of Bathin and everyone else here. Cork. Cork was on fire, literally in the zone, lighting up the feed. Let's see how he's going to be able to work this one. Already five eliminations putting the team on his back because we know Tui's down. That's going to be a great Ooh. tag there as well. And the finish up too. So Cork literally makes the second place. There's so much placement here, Ozzy. He is doing Ooh. it. He gets the rocket too. Can he maybe play spoiler with that rocket? Is it reloaded? Does it have any rockets in it? Oh. Does it drops them down right now? Sorry if it's here. He still has 11 builds. Volks is there too. Cork is a fantastic player, but a 1v2 against these two players. Barrels down is not going to happen. They go down and we have Volks, Sorif, and Sync, a team that was incredibly quiet game one, coming up with the big game two and same with Bathan. We saw it. The power of the rocket there almost came out, but you can't take high ground from these guys. Yeah, not for free, not at all. And man, just seeing Tui make it that far again, Hydro Dam proving how powerful he can be. He only had three rockets. That, that's enough expression in its own to show that he was putting those missiles down when he needed to for the rotates, for the positioning, and of course to secure his way all the way to those final instances. So great yeah. game from him, but multiple great games from him. Yeah, that's the thing, though, but this is what you love to see. It's a close leaderboard. We've got six games. That is a team that's massively struggled game one, picking up over 60 points in game two. So, so far, we've had big point jumps up. It's the limbs. It's the wins combined as well. We saw Will, Ashes, and Ronan in there a little bit, our first place team. I want to see how they ended up in there as well. Alec, Jinx, and Worthy, I made the call for them to step up. You called it. They were there in the end game, but I don't think they did enough. Yeah, no, they definitely fizzled out towards the tail end there, Ozzy. Yeah, they definitely fizzled out. We're going to have to see what we missed there. Maybe the analyst caught it for us. Let's break it down for us, guys. I want to see who is going to be on top of this leaderboard because it has to be close. Thanks, guys. As you said, it's already looking very, very close. Tons of elims flying around, especially by Repulse. And this time, of course, Ozzy, your prediction was on the money with Sink, Sarf, and Bulks walking away with the Victor Royale. I mean, Timmy, let's start with you. How did you feel about that one? As the boys were asking, there were a couple key moments that kind of led to that Victor Royale. Yeah, so what we actually saw was them trying to take it at half half as well, right? So they, they actually chopped um, Slayer, Fluxy, and um, Radius's builds out, and they started to fall. And then later on, so, so they're obviously extremely focused on it. Later on, they saw a potential beam on Radius. They took him down, and they took height from there. 
Yeah, I think Pretty what was interesting see. there is that two, the two attempts to take high ground in two games in a row now. We've seen the team that had high ground in the early late game not able to maintain high ground. It was the retake that was successful both games in a row. Of course, it was Luter and Co. in game number one. That game, it was Team Sync. So very impressive stuff on the retake here. A couple other interesting things that stood out to me. Well, it was the early game. It was this fight exactly. Vortex in Co. after a really, really strong game number one. They get taken out early. It seems like they're 50-50 in Craggy Cliffs. That time it was by Zedox, Bathan, and GLM's newest addition, CO. So keep expecting that Craggy Cliffs fight to heat up. Yeah, absolutely. And not even that. Like, what, the, One of the biggest things, again, that, I, that I, I really was noticing, again, Repulse, W King. Something that, that we were expecting coming into this. They ended up with five Elims by the time they got taken out. But as we watch all of these, we're still watching this fight uh, take it. Uh, get carried out in, in weather and it's just it's a bit of a 50-50 it's, it's quite entertaining to watch isn't it yeah that, that is right always fun to watch that weather station fight and of course the rotation over to Caddy Corner I know that's where Nick Merckx and Cypher PK were dropping in their debut their return to FNCS in the North American side of things and then what was really interesting was this fight right here to me this mid-game W key fight from Repulse we had some word coming into this tournament that Repulse and team were just going to key the entire time and that has certainly been true however it did not work out in their favor they did get speedy early as you see right here the three of them just jumping right into his box but it was Buzz and Looter who were able to clutch up in that 2v three and they're able to get speedy up right after yeah absolutely they got him up but unfortunately they actually didn't do anything with it um one thing that i think was really really important to note watch how all of these guys are getting these elims they are actually just running in the box and isolating one player it's very very um good strategy from all of these teams isolating a weak player and then jumping on them and as we as we move towards half half here you see lots of the same stuff people who are low on surge but here we are as you watch watch sorif uh sink and volks here take down radius and then after that take the high ground way too easy for them leaving himself wide open gets down and from there it's an easy retake uh and, and that's basically a win for the rest of the game yeah and that's what always happens isn't it whoever has high ground gets a little bit greedy tries to see if they can get some free elims on the rotation and ends up getting punished for it usually it's by a sniper and a headshot that time it was a team effort the the triple beam that came through from uh, uh, Sink and Co. They're able to take high ground, and we all know it, high ground easily wins games. They maintain their high ground, and not the craziest high elim game for them, but a first place finish in 30 points, that'll certainly help them out in the standings here, Vandy. I think so as well. It's all coming down to that height, which I love to see. And I'm kind of reminiscing, right? Because Fallout, when we did the first Australian Open, you know, showing our age here, it was all about that high ground again. It's cool to see that that's kind of stayed the same. Obviously, with seasons, it comes and goes. But I mean, do you have any kind of memories of that first AO as well? Any good ones? Oh my goodness. Let me just say Australian Open and Fortnite is certainly <laughs> synonymous with a great time. My favorite memory in my eyes, you saw it in actually the pregame video, was uh, was between Muselk and of course the Peking Duck Boys. It was awesome yes. meeting those two, actually getting a party and hang out with them. So great times at Australian Open back in 2019 and 2020. This time we're all virtual and obviously with the FNCS uh, debut in Australian Open, it's just great to be back working with Australian Open again. Couldn't have said it any better myself. But like I said, those reminiscing vibes definitely came through with match number two. So it sounds already like the action is going to be nonstop. Match number three, we're going to jump straight into it because we're kind of getting to that business end of things now. So I'm keen to see how the casters really strategize. and uh, Sorry, not the casters, where the players strategize into this one because the aggression has been out, like, out of the door right there. So let's toss it back to Aussie Antics and Monster as you guys prep us up for match number three. Match number three, getting ready to go. Thank you, guys. Again, Timmy talked about it there. This is some aggressive eliminations. They're jumping in. They're getting them. We talked about the snipers not coming into play, but it was all in the back of Volks with the big beam on high ground. And that's how quickly these games turn, Monster. Volks hit some good shots on high ground. They win the game. It's insane. And not only that, it's unlikely. That doesn't happen very often. Those high ground teams making one mistake, but that's what happened in the highest levels of competition. You make a mistake, you overpeak, you will be punished. But Ozzy, here is game number three. This time we get to watch Jinx off the back. This time we get to see Worthy touchdown as well. This is the Dirty Docks, the home of champions. And so far, Worthy and Jinx are having a rough time here. 
They are having a rough time here, seeing if they can jump up there. A bit of a recap on the leaderboard to kick this one off. You do. You have Will, Ronan, and Eshes out of retail row, still having the lead on 71 points, dropping back a little bit. You have Sorif, Volks, and Sync having the huge surge up out of Steamy Stacks with their victory out, putting them in second on 66 points. And you touched on a monster, Suns, Tui, and Core coming out of Hydra Dam on 53. So getting such a close leaderboard. Right now, sixth place only on 40 points. So we really do have it tight at the top, but the pressure is now on for Will Ronan and Eshes to kind of back it up here because Soros team's knocking on the door. Yeah, Soros team is here. He's got to continue to do what they're doing. And if they will, you know, if, if it all permits it, if the gods permit it, they'll be continuously sliding their way up those standings. That's where they definitely want to end this day off, right? Get it all, get the pressure out the door. Go ahead and call that week one. In my opinion, is the best way to do it. And then you can breeze back, play your prac the way you normally would. And, you know, Pull up on the heats and show everyone what time it is. You gotta show them what time it is, and time is now. This isn't 12 games like you're gonna see in the grand finals. This is six. They need to make something big. This is gonna mark the halfway point when this game's over. I see Sandjog trying to run out of this one. A team we haven't really seen anything for. Remy getting in another engagement. An entirely different team, a similar part of the map, but getting in yet again another fight here as Remy trying to hold this one down from the high ground. And Remy, Pace, and Spraz are not gonna be happy with how their tournament's going. They've got multiple teams trying to jump in and take out their loot rotation. It's that part of the map that just it's so sparse and it's so spread out it's so easy to make these plays as we see team mako falling here in the sweaty sands fight this one is not going to drag out like it did last time it is over in a matter of less than probably a minute yeah i mean it's about time right but this is what you expect as the games go on it just you know maybe that game one was just a, a bit of a fluke we tuned in at a time that you know the, the team wanted to hold down the gas station but like you said, with Remy, Pace, and King here, they're having a hard time. They're having a hard time with players uh, sniping into their loot routes. And, you know, if it's not one place, it's another. So, you know, that's that's just why they're so low in points. They're not really on track here. As Radius is going to fall here, Slayer has to come through, and they are. Slay and Pluxy are here to go and save the day. Yeah, they're going to come through and take this one out. And that's their Storm Surge as well. And they get this pick up here. They've even got it. Remy goes down those Witties team firing back again. This has to be so painful right now. I talked about it. I don't want to keep referring to them as the Middle East team as if that's like some kind of a negative right now. These guys showing that they can really hang with the best of the best on high ping. It's only to hype up their performance even more. The fact they chose to play on a region they don't usually choose to play on for FNCS. A few people question that they came in on 30 second only just making this finals round but proving when it comes to early game they know what they're doing yeah listen i have the pleasure of casting over tago in 2019 so for him to still wow. be competing yeah that like literally over a year later and you know, honestly popping off for what it's worth right we're talking about a ping disadvantage on oce catching his own highlights like that's a w in its own and look they're giving remy king and of course pace a run for their money like they're not making this easy at all pace being a, the distance away you can see the 2v1 and now finally they get together but listen they've been operating in low and high ground perfectly and the low ground peak there is going to punish king again yeah, they're going to try and punish this one if they can. Spraz making his way through down into this one, jumping back up. They don't have the best loadout, but it's enough to close this one out. I talk about handling it with the best of the best, and unfortunately can't handle them this game. Four eliminations on the board. They have to get Remy back up. Maybe the elimin eliminations being enough, and we have another team down here at Camp Cod, a spot that really can give you enough loot for multiple teams, but no one's here right now. This is a really good drop they have on lockdown for themselves, but only 11 points on the board. I'm expecting a bigger game from them here if they can try to pull it all together yeah definitely off to a rough spot but listen it's, it's still the halfway mark right this is game number three there's still plenty of rounds of fortnite to go ahead and get out in front of you i'd say you need about four good games so if you can hold your mental strength you can keep calm be patient and keep to the game plan i think it's, you can you can definitely spin the narrative around with the last four rounds of fortnite yeah, I think that's what you got to try and do. You got to spin the narrative right now as Radius and Slayer's team playing so aggressive here in the mid ground. Really clearly, sorry, mid game, clearly just wanting to kind of have some fun with this one. We talked about a few teams out there who are openly going to play very, very aggressive, not worrying too much about whether they get the top 10 because this is a team that wants to make sure they can play every week. They don't want to automatically qualify through here in week one. They are that confident in their own gameplay and that's why they're taking these hyper aggressive fights and unfortunately for teams potentially like Aussie Four Eyes, Vertix and Ice they're the ones who are going to be on the receiving end of just so much aggression. 
Yeah, no doubt about it. Four Eyes here is going to be the one getting pressured out the most here as he gets pinched from both sides. And it's not looking good, but he claps back. What a great Ooh. shot onto Slaya there. Literally, a reaction shot as he lets him into the box. Ooh. And oh my gosh, Radius just answers that one as well. So it's a tit for tat, a trade on both sides here. But it's looking like the power is still in Pluxy and company's hand. They are W king their way through this. Even the builds are going to break here. This thing's not going to have too much time left here now. Yeah, all they got to do is pin some maneuver this one. Radius pressuring one wall, Fluxy on the other, but Fluxy actually goes for the revive on Slayer. Smart play there as well. The extra elimination is important, but if you get the revive, you don't have to go through the whole process and time of rebooting as they're going to be able to find Snay anyway. But as I say that, really smart play here, getting into the sand. Fluxy's looking for this one. If they can get some shots and no, Snay's not going to get away, gets pushed out of the sand and Fluxy closes that one out. The insane mid-game aggression, six eliminations on the board. I'm talking about how they want to play aggressive but i mean they're gonna get enough points eliminations alone to put them in top 10 at this rate yeah definitely and listen fluxy read that play like a book he knew hey this guy's gonna try and get away we're not gonna let him he gets trapped there like a mouse in a trap and all of a sudden it's all over on the other side though not too far just north it's basso vortex and wavy jace who's got a couple of options in front of them players at the coliseum players behind them trying to rotate on up it seems like they're going to take the passive route. Unlike these other squads that are already pushing six plus eliminations, they're just looking to hang out and vibe out. But 26 points in the competition. I'm going into game three. Ozzy, tell me, what do you think their chances are like performing well and pulling the top 10? I think they can. Like I said, this is a team that actually dominates low ground really, really well, has performed together for multiple FNCSs now. One of the teams that's returning here as a full trio, I have full faith in them. If they don't do it today, they will 100% do it in one of the remaining weeks here. And I mean, they're showing their competitive prowess there already. Taking Zayt Hill, one of the best spots early game to get those Storm Surge tags, clearly proving what their strategy is here. They want to be able to get their Storm Surge. They're not going to look to box fight for it. They're going to go for the range tags as we see Ronan, Eshes, and Will, our first place team, making the rotate out of retail using the superior mobility in the vehicles but unfortunately looks like our Ashes might have to come back here and give Will a lift because I don't know just not hitting the same speed yeah what's going on here <laughs> definitely you know kind of cruising on via that's the difference in the vehicle shots will be coming in from the distance here so you do still have to be careful it's no safe cruise down these streets not for too long here's a wide shot look at the map you can see the widespread of players on the south western portion here they're going to be moving in nice and late everyone else basing up mainly in the middle already those sand rotates coming in so heavy on the north side basically clear as day sky's looking real nice up there weather's chilling probably how it is in australia right now i don't know you tell me ozzy uh, you know i'm over here it's cold and it's cold in north america how's it looking over there in australia it's looking pretty good i mean if you're talking about those guys who are kind of you know vibing out on the zero ping in sydney it's, it's a little bit overcast it's a little bit cloudy but these guys are kind of happy with this one as district clearly has open sight lines here trying to hit the snipes downwind here if they can as they're going to keep making the rotate around the outside but yeah it's looking all right i mean obviously a little bit earlier in the day or later in the day depending on how you've got how far you've gone into the night monster but we'll see how the rest of this one shapes up. Yeah, no doubt about it. We'll see. We will see. Here's Yonder, though. And Gusto's on the other side trying to do their thing. Playing into the zone. No white heels for Gusto's. Not looking good for him. Yonder on the other side, completely different situation. All the heels that he needs and a full team to back him up as well. But the difference is that they only have 17 points. They need more. They're going to need more out of this one if they can. And that's the thing. OC puts the pressure on, right? They get the eliminations. They step up early. And that's what really motivates the teams to chase. They set the pace. It's always been like that in OC ever since back in World Cup when you had one player who was going to get that prestigious qualification. If you saw a few of the good players get a couple of 20 bombs early, there is no playing for second in this region. That's how most of them have their eyes on it. It's either go big, get the eliminations, or go home. They don't have that kind of long goal set placement orientation in mind. And that's what you're seeing here is another engagement breaks down here onto Lupius this time. Driller SMG trying to push forward. Kixi and grab a team we haven't seen too much from trying to close in and help this one here and provide some assistance as it looks like potentially wasn't Lupius that was getting pushed in on. I think he was disengaging and doing the damage on the way out. Yeah, definitely. But hey, they're taking advantage. They swing this fight around. Put a dog in the corner. They're going to fight back. And that's what looks like is happening right here. He's going to go and go for the trade shot. Doesn't hit it. But Lupi has got the pressure line on Ottawa. Who doesn't have any shield. So it's a messy battle. He's trying to get involved. Get in the mix. And no, the peak there. They were continuously keeping an eye on Ottawa there. And that's a free knock for them. 
probably very happy about that one. Graph's going to fall too. So exchanges everywhere, but they do win. And all of a sudden it went from what? Seven, eight players or so to like no one's left in sight. Yeah, no one's left inside. They've cleared out this area. We talked about it before. Is creating your own dead slides. We're going to see potentially a bit of power on power action here. Muzzler and Speedy set up right on top of Radius Slayer and Fluxy. And we already know who probably started this fight. We know who's been playing aggressive and who's been playing the end games. We have our, t our game one winners, Luna, Muzz, and Speedy playing for those placements. Not getting too many points last game, though. Only 49 here. And then right now we have Fluxy, Slayer, and Radius who have had their elimination points racking up here. Actually on top of them on the leaderboard now, trying to push into this fight as Fluxy gets taken low, not looking good at all. Luna trades out a little bit as well. But I have to say, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, this is one of the scariest teams in OCE. Luna and Muzz are on a whole nother level. Your typical young fraggers, specifically Muzz. He's only recently started streaming and posting his content of gameplay and already is getting the world's attention because he really is not just good, but flashy. It's so impressive to watch. Yeah, let's not forget, we did get to watch them clash against Repulse oh, yeah. God in the last round as well, who went down immediately too to that team. So this is a scary, scary trio, and they've already proven it in this round. They've literally already proven it today. And the box fighting meta right now coming out. Luda's got that epic tactical shock done, doing 80 damage to structures, which is so important. More than a pickaxe with a higher fire rate, and it means you don't have to switch between that shotgun and pickaxe. You don't slow down. It doesn't leave you vulnerable. And that's what Luda was choosing there to get claim those flaws. And maybe Radius and Fluxy and Slayer thinking, hey, Okay, this is clearly a solid team, and that's what it's like on OCE. Timmy talked about it earlier. There's a pretty big skill discrepancy when it comes to the top team and the lower team sometimes. So teams like this, Radius, Fluxy, and Slayer, have all the confidence in the world pushing into fights, but if you don't take the time to gauge who it is, it can get you bit, and they are looking way worse for wear coming out of this one. Yeah, for sure, and look at this, though. Still inching their way forwards, making sure that the coast is clear, that the place is clear. Talked about the... High quality power shock and they have, but he has an AR to back it up as well, making it ever so more scary for this situation though. Here's a wide shot to give you guys a nice look at what's going on. So the fight that's happening here does catch the attention of everyone else nearby, but luckily none of those shots are gonna come flying on in. So things are gonna settle for now as we're pushing into zone number three as it reveals itself. I mean, I think everyone's attention is already distracted by the other players around them. OCE living up to its name. You talked about it, Monster. You're now here in my turf, in my area. And this doesn't look any different to me. It probably looks very different to you. The amount of teams just oh, taking yeah. fights with each other, <laughs> boxing up and just going for it. But again, it's always entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Listen, OCE sets the pace, man. These early game instances. You know, the first game, I was like, oh, hold up. Maybe, you know, broadcast influence, right? Things are looking a little slow. <laughs> nope. No, nah, man, we got the half and half out. <laughs> There was a, a stacker of players right on top of one another. So yeah, they don't they don't even these guys are not rotating or anything. They're no. sitting right next to one another. It's box fights everywhere. It's box fights everywhere. As here we see Radius Slayer and Fluxy surely have just po like bitten off more than they can chew with this team. Luda Muzz and Speedy backing up the accolades I put on them. But unfortunately, another team pushing here now, and now Luda's pinned off from the side, blocks this one off, but another team shows up, which might be what Slayer, Radius, and Fluxy need to disengage. But again. This is OCE. Maybe they're not going to disengage. Maybe they think they're already in too deep. They have to go for a miracle hero play to get some damage on the board because, I mean, 12 HP, no shields. Slayer looks like he's, what, yeah, 47 HP, no shields. Fluxy, 30 HP, 50 shield. They really don't have the health advantage going into this one, but I don't think you need me to tell you that. Yeah, no, and Fluxy gets taken out there as well. Here's the team below the Surge, too. So you know they're going to be looking to hop in some boxes. Whereas all the fighting that Radius and company did, man, was it even worth it? Because now, yes, they're above the surge, but no, they don't have anything to work with. Looter, Muzz, and Speedy on the other side looking like the complete opposite, right? Look, now they're going to find Slayer. One tag from this AR, one tag from anything in the inventory, and it's all over for these guys. Yeah, it's going to be all over for them. And this is pretty much, I guess, really good for W Puck's team right here. They had to push into this one. They had Storm Surge kind of knocking on the door. They needed damage, and they found some free damage on a team that was really struggling as Slayer's got that charge shotgun sizzle, and he's charging it up, trying to get that full damage spot. And see if he can try and find something. 17 HP, though, he's going to need to. Yeah, definitely. Just trying to fend them off, right? Scare them off. And that's not the team you want to jump into. No, that's Looter and Company. Let's this guard down. It's Jace who walks in from behind and others. So now that's all over. Back with Muzz, Looter, and Speedy, though. How are they going to play this? Now they back their way up. They have these layers all to themselves. All this extra loot as well. So for a zone three, not too bad now. The refreshers are going to play into their benefit. Remember, they didn't have too many heals. They had some, but not much. So again, 
Here's a team that's middling because of the fight actions, right? Because of the fighting decisions they've made so early in the game. And I think zones can be really important here as right now you see a pretty, you know, standard zone is around the middle of the map but the first sand zone we're going to see on OCE. And if you haven't been playing Fortnite too much in Chapter 5, you may not have known this, but the sand giving superior mobility as well as having those, uh, you got the, the rocks around, you got the zero point rocks to try and give you that extra dashing ability. But going inside the sand, hitting the rotates, I was watching NA East qualifying games and man, it was like ball at 2.0. You could see like 30 people just rotating in the sand as, as you see beautifully done here by the two teams top and bottom right here hitting the rotates keeps you protected you take damage but you don't take damage until the sand breaks you out so it gives you a little bit of a buff it's pretty risky if you get caught though but you can see the speed of the rotate so right now this end game may be hopefully holding up to be a little bit more stacked but what am i kidding oc is not getting in the sand you can't shoot while you're in the sand yeah definitely <laughs> if you can't shoot they don't want no part of it they want the action you got to keep the hands you know, hot and fresh, hot and ready to say the least here. But hey, that was like a well-timed script. You know, as soon as we talked about it, the <laughs> camera action, the pan and shot, it all backed it up right there. Here though, we have a different script unfolding. We have a team that's way down the standings here that needs to fight their way up. Not only that, it's looking like it might not make it to surge at all because of the, fight, the fact that there's so many teams now that are literally looking to fight and close this gap, right? Coming into this halfway, halfway mark. Coming to the half point market. This is where it's so important. We've seen so many teams dominate once they get their high ground. We've seen a bit of a swing. Last game, Volks's team being able to take Radius's team off the high ground on half half. But for the most part, once you get it, you're looking really, really good. And that's why you'll notice on the bottom right with this mini map, a lot of the players choosing to set up on the edge. This is one of the main zones and the first zone you really do want to set up on the edge because the next zone is going to be what we call half half. It's going to be half in the old storm, half in the existing map. So you want to stay on the edge because if you're in the middle, that's the only place that guarantees you don't get the zone where previous zones before this one two and three middle of the zone is actually a good spot to be because it increases your chance of getting it yeah no doubt about it let's see and there's a couple teams like dead center right now as well so they're gonna have to possibly make a move no matter what that's gonna cost them a little bit but we'll see how it all ends up shaking up and playing out Back with Jinx, Alec, and Worthy, the Dirty Docs champs here. Now, looking to get involved, and that's Bailey's squad on the other side of the wall. Bailey is doing pretty decent so far. I believe they were just on the bubble of the top 10. So, got to continue to stay consistent. Actually, avoid teams like Worthy and these guys who are also just outside of that top 10 as well, trying to knock their way in after having a pretty decent game two. Not the greatest game one, actually scoring their first zero points like we mentioned before. But on the other spectrum, it's Tui. Tui with the RPG in hand. RPG and do they get the half half? I think they may have actually got half half here with the RPG on the very edge of it, I believe. Oof. Yes, on the very edge right now. But that means Luda, Speedy, and Muzz are pretty close. But I'm seeing a big amount of players on that south side that don't get it. And I think I just saw Storm Surge going onto Sorif's team here as we now see Brezzo only 33 above. So potentially Volks, Sorif can have to make something happen here. Sink's gonna have to try and get in and get some damage. Not a team I'm used to seeing below Storm Surge. Maybe I couldn't have seen that as Tui with the downrange beam with that left. Legendary heavy assault rifle. Never mind. Tui didn't get the half half. I could not be more wrong. And Sink taking the shots. Tui really been hitting the aim trainers, apparently. Yeah, definitely. Aim looking on point, especially that, that legendary AR, man. It does so much damage, even at distance. It's basically every time it connects, it's almost a full 50 pot. Think about it that way. Think about how much of an upset, how much of a reset that is for teams that get tagged just one time on the peak. Here's Volks and company, though, looking to start putting in shots of their own now because they absolutely have to. They're just barely above the surge, and they may be okay now, but if the surge carries into the next moving, which it most likely will, that'll be where the big problem is. You really want to come into that zone about 200 or so above to be safe and know that you're comfortable for those moving rotates. Yeah, ro surge on rotating can be an absolute killer there. It's one of the most difficult things to deal with. You're already dealing with so much. What layer are we on? High ground, low ground. Don't get dropped in. Control that wall. Then you're trying to do damage. You're being forced to do damage is the scary spot to be. And you're right. As Jinx, Alec, and Worthy just not looking like themselves here. We get one shot of them and they're not looking great at all. As Pumpkin here up on the high ground trying to do something if they can here with Suns as well. Venice, you also got a little base. So we've got a, quite a few people on this half half who've left their tops open and spread out in these big bases it's all going to be about who gets the fabled sixth zone who gets half half into the first rotating because that's the other one that matters and here it is faulty's team looking really good and most of the lobby unfortunately looking really bad yeah and it looks like trixie and them do pull the best zone i guess for this this next moving right but 
Wake and hard worker here, pumpkin. Right, they're gonna go ahead and rotate around the outside as well. So they're gonna get well in front of this zone too. Okay, and they're gonna also be able to secure the loot. Remember, this is gonna cut right through the edge of that Coliseum. So being that they have this natural high ground now, they will be able to really look down and ping players that want to try and rotate on the sand dune. Now you notice that little dark line in the road means that players are going to get thrown out and thrusted out of the sand. If they're not ready for that, that is free beans for anyone on height. And there it is. Teams are just opening up. And look at the line of fire, the barrel shot. We talked about it. Gustav is going to fall there because of it. Oh. And this is the angle. The harpoon too. No way. He's going to be able to pull them up. That would have been crazy, but he might be able to get this loot here. Yes, he does. Minis, heals. Can he get the mats though? And he sure Ooh. does as well. Wow. Almost what a refresher. 400 brick. That's a big one. And again, this team, obviously, a bit of a name change. Us casters love here. This player on the front side, hard worker, is known as the competitive veteran himself, Cypher. Someone who's been around since the beginning of OC competitive, the dawn of time. And it's just so great to see him on the high ground, on the first official broadcast, seeing what he can do. No stranger to AO as well. Unless I'm mistaken, I know 100% he was at the last Australian Open. And I think he was at the first as well, as Suns is the one who's putting out the beam right now as well, as Pace making his way through this low ground. These caddy corner fights have gone against them. Only 20 points on the board in the sand, trying to see what he can do. Only 30 builds to his name. It's going to be a struggle. And this is the play style that we saw with Timmy hype up so much. Luda, Muzz, and Speedy on the mid ground, controlling, not going for the height, no attempt to take it whatsoever, getting their limbs and making their way through the middle. And what a, what a ridiculous loadout to have in that mid ground, right? Compact SMG and power shotguns, like the tactical for that high fire rate in, in this trio settings. Like that is the perfect kind of loadout that you can use to bully players and deal massive amounts of damage box to box in the mid and low ground layers. That is the perfect loadout that you're going to be looking for. Your Sorf though, Sorf on a move, going to go ahead and eat his flopper so early. The bad edit oh. though, no, the misplay and the storm surge. You know what? It was over no matter what, but honestly, yeah. you don't want to go down on mainstream for a missed edit. So all of a sudden now, again, they're also just not in shape right now where we expected them. So Jinx and Vox's team, you know, is struggling a bit here tonight. Struggle a little bit here, and I haven't seen Esher's Will or Ronan too much here, but this is a team that was up there trying to push their way up into the very top in fourth place. We have them pushing through as Luda goes down now. It's going to be up to Speedy and Muzz, the dynamic duo. This is the duo who's been playing together for seasons now. Luda came in to fill out the trio, and Speedy goes down. I've been hyping him up all night long. Muzz, one of the best players in the region, in my opinion, but he's going to have to prove it here because he's doing it solo. The hardest way to do it in trios on a mid-ground layer that is now getting focused. He was actually second height which is a scary spot to be as Cypher's team is making their way, working it down. There is Raptor getting pushed down as well. They have to run from the onslaught of high ground because that is three solid players above you with so much firepower. Yeah, and look at this. We're in the last zone with 11 teams up. This is the most stacked game we've gotten to cast over so far as far as the placement goes. And no one wants to fall now. There's so much placement points just in fingertips reach, but you have to stay alive. And that's the hardest thing to ask for when high ground is putting down pressure the way they are. Look at the mid ground teams all falling. How is Muzz still alive here with the limited mats that he has? Literally working with anything. He still has chunk splash still. Plenty of opportunity. No, that's even better for Pumpkin. That's almost a perfect situation. Perfect storm for high ground now to go ahead and secure the victory here. And here it is, Basil, Vortex, and Jace, the team that I vouch for to guaranteed qualify if they put the pieces together, pushing 50 points now as Pumpkin's pushing this fight right now. Morph has to go down, proving they're not just putting out the pressure with the ARs. They can do it box to box with the shotguns as well. Four teams alive. This is it. Whoever goes down now is missing out on so many points. And there it is. No, still on four. Morph goes down, but there's still four teams up. There's the three. They fall down. Basil, Vortex, Jace are going to pick up those crucial placements. Now it's second. DJ Clutch up the third place as a solo boxes here we go let's see who can make this one happen i don't Ooh, see cypher anyway goes. suns is looking healthy so maybe going for the heal off but never mind basil's fighting for the high ground yeah this is looking all kinds of messy for the high ground team vortex actually has the lead now so when we thought that they weren't going to be able to actually just walk away with this they come up and now basil all of a sudden has the lead with vortex and vortex has the suns. health advantage this is going to come down to the second right oh, now two. and basil just stays alive forever so much longer and not even the siphon was enough ozzy he just stood alive following the zone there
2 HP. I was going to say there, why is the player that's on 12 health trying so hard to stay in zone? You usually have the healthier player stay at the front side, try to keep the heals and try to go for the heal off. And I thought, man, just go back and do some damage. Get out of the way so you don't get the siphon. But no, that extra one tick was enough. 2 health with the win. And again, a team that I knew was going to qualify and do big things. I talked about it from the low ground. And yeah, I guess we shouldn't have counted them out. If any team can take out high ground in that position, it's the OC low ground kings. And listen, the other squad had the, the chug splash. You had everything, but that's what happens. You really got to pay attention to that timer on the clock. It shows you when the final zone is going to fully close that countdown. If you go in too early, that's the missing ticks. That's going to yeah. cost the difference in you not winning the heal off. It's a big difference right now. And if people know this meta, they know heal offs on the cars. They know the potentials there. So they're quick to look back in a zone. They're quick to pressure those walls. If they can find the player they know has the meds, especially if you don't have that really high, high established, they know who you are. They're going to spray the walls. And with 10 ticks, you don't have a lot of time in between. But we'll have to see. We know how close it came, but how close is the leaderboard? Please break it down for us, analysts. Let us know because this, again, is going to go right down to the wire. Cheers, guys. I mean, I know this was going to be close, right? But I didn't know that it was going to come down to a heal off and then 2 HP. I was just like, oh my goodness, on the edge of my seat. But guys, Timmy, how did you feel about that one? Well, for the first time, we actually saw a, a mid-ground team taking a win. We saw um, Cyper, Pumpkin, and their third basically controlling height all the way from first moving, taking it really easily on, on the transition of first moving. And then from there, it was all about Basil, Jason, Vortex, controlling space, getting those kills mid-ground, and it was, it was beautiful to watch. Yeah, and I, I got to say, on top of that, they're so good, those three, Jason Co. at box diving and holding hands and rotating as a team. They picked up at least four or five or six eliminations through the late game there. But for a while, it really looked like the uh, the, the Speedy Looter and Muzz show. They dominated in the early late game. You thought they had the perfect loadout. You thought it was them that was going to hold that mid game. So and it was them that actually took it. We're going to jump to a quick break. We'll come back in just a little bit.
Awesome. Easy. Oh. I'll just do it. Here we are. We are back. We are past the halfway point. We are going into game number four. It is already underway and the leaderboard is so close at the top. We have 74, 72 and 71 for the top three and 70 for fourth place. This is looking ridiculous. We're going to throw it into game four to see how it's going to break down because this game is going to have to be the deciding point. Surely someone has that other game they need to jump through and surge through. Yeah, no doubt about it. If you're a betting person, I don't know. It's a four horse race and it is going to be anyone's now as they, you know, again, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So we'll see it. This is game number four beyond the halfway mark. We're kicking things off. You can see Cynical's down and only another team is down other than that. So all of a sudden the pacing coming into game four, reality kicks in. It's all real. It's all becoming very, very real that you have to take your time now and win these games. When you think about it, right, we have eliminations worth two points right now. So there is one elimination separating first from second. There is half an elimination separating second <laughs> from third. And then there's another half elimination separating third from fourth. So this is so close at the top. You have Muzz, Luda, and Speedy in first on 74. Basil, Vortex, and Jace in second on 72. Will, Ronan, and Eshes in third on 71. And then Sorif, Volks, and Sink in fourth on 70. It is so close right now. Interesting to note as well, Will, Ronan, and Eshes, the only team in the top four right now who don't have a victory royale. Yeah, and not only that, they're the only team that last game didn't place inside the top 10 as well. So again, they're, uh, you know, they start off very, very strong, very powerful. That game three was just a bad game. Is that going to be the momentum killer? That's what we're, that's the question. That's what we're going to have to see if Will, Ron, and Esh can actually answer here because it's so close to the top. And now that's more pressure for them because they had a 20 point lead coming into this. And it's like that, that lead has disappeared. There is no lead anymore. It's all completely reset. Yeah, and that's the thing. They came in. We have a quick stat here. The reigning OC FNCS champions competing today consists of Jinx, Alec, and Worthy. And again, Jinx three times FNCS as well. If you somehow watch any OC, you already know that statistic. But that is one you have to mention, especially when we're tuning into 15 points. I don't even know what's going wrong here today. Yeah, man, listen, y'all, it's anyone's game. They do have a couple of weeks, of course, to call. Things should get easier for any tier one elite style trio, right, as the weekends go. But again, if you're a fan, if you're a fan of any of these players that are having a, a rough one right now, you know, it, it's, it's a tough it's a tough thing to watch, right? Watch your favorite teams, especially champion teams that you know are just better than the performances we're watching unfold. Even when they make it to those end games, like we saw them multiple times with all the loot in the world, they were still fizzling out. Things were still going wrong for them. So there's going to be a lot of review that needs to be done. There's going to be some patches in that gameplay that have to be hit up. Yeah, there's going to be some patches as right now. Mako's team definitely has those patches, and I think one of them is how they're playing this Sweaty Sands fight. They get a bit of loot, they stand up on these houses, and it just draws out into this massive long battle where no one ends up winning, and that's what their points have to show for it. As again, Brezzo, our last FNCS champion in solos, obviously in lands, different environment, but still only four points combined in three games. They're averaging just over one point a game right now as they push in onto Sayo, Zedox, and Bathory, who's been having a better tournament, but still not a phenomenal one by their own standards. Yeah, no, but listen, 36 points, that's still a top 15 situation, right? That's still, you're just right there. You're not in the back half. You're not in the front half. You're right in the middle. You can swing either which way. And there's a team you want to fight. You want to fight a team without that many points, a team that's struggling so far. So for Zedox, for Sayo, Ooh. for Bathan here, I think they're chilling. I think they're feeling really good. The shield crack there is going to be enough to, again, give them the confidence swing of what they're looking Ooh, for. Brezzo. Brezzo's trying to sneak up, though. Ooh, the this sneak? is very scary. This is very scary. Brezzo, obviously, on that controller, too, can lay down some serious pressure, but not hitting a single shot here, unfortunately. No. Has the high ground control, but just wasn't really the kind of, I don't know, the advantage you wanted to see from such a sneaky engagement as we now have all the teams here kind of culminating on this one as Brezzo's on the high ground, only 36 builds, and it's going to turn on into a full-on realistic 3v3 build fight here. I don't even know what's going on. Brezzo getting in. They managed to signal out one of the players. Zedox goes down, found in a box by himself, and Culture and Brezzo make their way into this fight. Crack it open. That's one elimination, but are you going to get the other two? Oh, and they're holding them too, trying to get the max surge off of it. Sayo is going to continue to watch this from a distance, though. And I don't know, if I'm this team, I actually want to back up here, right? Like I said, they are in the like literal middle of the pack. They are just on the front half of this pack here. And for them to stick around and fight this team in Brezzo, 
like i mean i don't know it just doesn't seem very worth it right now you might just want to go ahead and take your time but hey it's oce we're talking about here i've already said my fair share before about teams looking to disengage and they just say no monster we're not <laughs> going to do that we're going to continue to fight these out tooth and nail all the way through to the very Ooh. end and look even against better judgment you can see how it can play out the dragon shot even i think that's actually the first time we've seen it here today it can be so lethal and so unforgiving though if you miss that shot as bridge making his way down he has the smg in the back pocket see what they can do is bathan steps out here goes toe to toe with culture backs himself to win this one only has a little bit of builds and then culture gets knocked here so bathan is going down swinging trying to jump up into that 40 point threshold like you said they're around that top 15 they want to secure that top 10 to make sure they qualify no builds left. Almost that could have been so bad, Monster. This high off the ground, going to side jump, then realizing you have no Ooh, builds. Luckily, catches ramp. himself. But can he get culture? Can he get the side? But can he get the mass base and look behind you? Oh my gosh, that was so close. That was actually his ramp. So he canceled the heal, almost made the edit, missed this pixel, missed it by a pixel. He would have got the siphon there too. So, so close. Here's hard worker though. Cypher looking to put the sniper shot in and no, he's actually going to miss it. His team's going to get sniped in return and return as well from four eyes. Another team that's looking off in the distance. This is such a scrappy, scrappy fight right now. And look, everyone's got eyes on the field a team on the mountain that's four eyes team coming out of craggy cliffs i'm i'm assuming and then you can see that they can see right into the coliseum where there's what three nine maybe, maybe 20 <laughs> players here my gosh i'm looking at this like did we add henchmen back right because i'm seeing a lot of arrows on the mini map as if we have some kind of npc there's only one guy that hangs out here in the coliseum so i don't think that's the case this is just the place to be for all these teams apparently as right now we do we have cypher sunswick and pump down there our second place team from last game slayer who always drops here code russian who i don't know why is here i'm not sure what's going on maybe the arena has become the place to duke it out arena style yeah and look mammal off in the distance top 10 there were asto and oha uh, oah meadow too so again Teams vibing out literally big squads in the nearby area. And look, Sunwix is actually going to finish up Slayer. So Slayer is down. He's out for the count right now. He's down for the count here. And they're going to try and push their way. As you see that qualifying format here, that's the round four different to round three scoring. Victory Al is going to net you 30 points total. Second place gets 25. Third gets 20. And then fourth only gets 14. That's where that big jump occurs that we've been talking about. Top three is where it all matters. And each elimination is two points total as well. So that's why you're seeing teams on really, really high points and really, really low. You get a couple eliminations and a seventh. You're actually really not looking that good. Yeah, for sure. And this team here is playing the zone nice and late, and everyone's going to be looking to disengage. So, so, there are some smart plays to be made here for OCE. Okay, proving me all wrong. Looking for the. Oh, I lied. Okay, now they're looking to find another <laughs> team. They found the one on You will the learn, there. monster. You will it learn. They're always looking to fight. Maybe they just didn't see the <laughs> opponent. That's usually the reason why they're running the other direction. If they've seen them, they're probably going to fight them. But no, never mind. Lupi is grabbing Keeksy. I'm going to hit this rotate. Zone's not too fast. So it's not the worst time to take a fight if you really want to. And I have to think with the rotate around the backside, no, it's for the campfire. Okay, we're going to play this smart. We're going to get every little bit of health we can. And then we're going to run at the team. <laughs> I was going to say, what are the chances we just run a prediction right now and like let <laughs> chat vote if whether or not they're going to W key that team with the vehicle. Either way, we'll never know. We're going to hop over with Kazi Russian. Spy 5, two Elims already in the Coliseum. One of those 12 players that we counted out earlier. Maybe even more now. So, so many squads, so many teams here. And because this is the central hub, because this is the place to be, basically, to cash the next zone, look, there's more players migrating in. The sand just helps everyone do that as well. Yeah, the sand makes it so much easier on this area of the map as well. You've got the zero point rocks, which I have tested, by the way, are actually faster than the sand, but you always feel so scared. You break it, you go to pick it up, and you know for that half a second while you pop it, you are so vulnerable to that deadly headshot snipe. So always sketchy to use, especially when you have this many players with this many sightlines. But you've got to think right now, Vortex's team, our game three winning team, is looking so healthy on that northeast side of the map right now. Just no one anywhere near them. Yeah, and look at that. You can see, they, like you said, they're just sitting up there just outside the steamy stacks. Look at that nice, slow, late rotate. Let, let everyone else do the hard work for you, right? Let everyone else battle it out. So Volks is going to be coming in nice and late. Slow off the rotate. Here's Quark still alive. Cyrex up. SPG's DJ still there too. Sunswick, like we said, who took out Slayer. And, and Cypher Pumpkin and Sunswick, 
kudos to them respect to them because they're in sixth place those elims that they picked up that full trio wipe puts them one step closer to the top five they're literally fighting their way up whereas cork and company they're off in the distance they're not in the coliseum they're not in the fights they're trying to play passive trying to play slow he's safe here right two different game styles two different sides of the coin but both equally as effective yeah both equally effective in how they're playing it but it's just why is everyone at the Coliseum? I guess it's uh, I guess it's middle of the map. It's it's a structure that can't be broken. You can take the high ground, but it would be so amazing to see this zone just close ever and ever so more around Coliseum, and then it just becomes the absolute RNG coin flip of do you get half or the first rotating? Because that's what's going to have to dictate this, because none of these teams are going to want to move fast, and I didn't really get too many eyes on the material there, Monster, but looking at these bases and how little material there is inside Coliseum, surely they're not looking too hot. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I was going to say. I was like, if you're here, you're probably thinking, hey, maybe we can just go ahead and refresh, refarm up, right, and contain, uh, control some some decent layering, some decent ground. And that's what Pumpkin and, and company are doing here. But, I mean, they were here way early, right? They were here for the fight. They were here for the refresh on the battle. Here, Sorif is going to hit a nice shot and a body tag to follow up there. That was just filthy of a shot there. A cold, cold shot served up. Hold up. Sandro is going to get to his, his squad. So, okay. Not the uh, not the knock he's looking for, but definitely a great, great way to kick this off and continue to dominate the space that they're holding because this is the latest team to rotate into the zone. And 69 players alive, 24 teams here. So they're just under that 70 threshold for Storm Surge. But remember, it was Volk, Sorif, and Sink who struggled so heavily with Storm Surge last game. So those little body snipes are actually huge. 100 free damage like that for no return is massive. They really need to get more of those on the board if they want to have a consistent game here, especially with their positioning. I've talked about the teams that are on those edges with no one around them. They are one of those teams. And now they've got to make the very open sideline rotate to get to the Coliseum. They're going to be able to use the sand they can maybe use those zero point rocks but either way they're going to be very open yeah and that's that's actually very really interesting right this is the first time we get to watch them early on the rotate you saw how late they were coming in and that was why storm surge was probably a big big factor for the last game maybe even the games before that because they didn't get a lot of air time coming into those first two rounds so again the questions being answered mysteries being solved here for teams like volks who are struggling today where we expect to be a little bit better maybe a little stronger Take this quick stat here, though, Ozzy. Talk to us about these 30-plus point games. Wow. We have Goeg, Scammed, and Zalka having four qualifying games with over 30-plus points, the most of any team. you got to remember, that qualifying one, those were eliminations worth one, win worth 25. So they had four games where they managed to pick up those big point elimination games. So consistency as well. You've only got 10 games, and if you're winning them or if you're getting you know, that far into endgame to rack up that many points, you don't have many games to do that. And we've seen that story on other regions as well monster some crazy consistency we had kami's team in eu getting five wins in a row but then not making it out of round three so sometimes you know it might not be the best indicator of the stack lobby performance but still so impressive nonetheless yeah definitely impressive super impressive someone's being impressive so far is gusto's district and bantis doing pretty okay in the competition so far currently housing themselves again in that 15 slot we talked about teams that are right on that bubble that was them Squads that need to be very, very cautious of what fights they take. And it seems like they've managed to reboot and re-pick up their entire team. So back in it. In the feed, though, Zalker finds finds a big one there on two weeks. So that means the RPG might be exchanging hands. That means you might be seeing an exchange of the rocket launcher go into Zalker's hands. That could be devastating for everyone coming into it. Because when you give a rocket launcher to a team that doesn't really play with it very often, those are the psychopaths. Those are the guys that feel, they're, they're just going to feel themselves, right? They're going to be like, hey, listen, we got this thing. Let's go take height. Let's go do something because you've got to do something big at this point in the game. Only six games. This is game number four. It's really your time to jump up. This format does reward that big elimination win for high points. And that's how Epic has kind of gone about with the logic on this one. Round four, you want to reward the eliminations when you're versing harder opponents. And you want to be able to reward those really consistent top threes. That does allow for teams, though, who haven't been playing as consistently to have huge leaps and bounds forward. Like we saw with Ronan, Eshes, and Will, who are still up there on the leaderboard despite kind of fizzling out after their game one but it means they can do it again or anyone else can do it as well as a team like spiker doesn't maybe into too much 40 points on the board decent part of zone but this one is just closing in more and more around the coliseum 
Yeah, I mean, right now, zone four is going to determine itself. Normally, right here in the zone three, you want to be right in the middle, and it is going to do just that. It's going to pull dead center, so the Coliseum is not going to be the place to home the territory that this is going to end in. Not just yet, at least. Remember, half and half out can still draw right back to the Coliseum. Those moving zones, when they start pulling the distance, those max distances go far. They go well and beyond several hundred meters. So, again, it will again potentially come back around and if it does that's a good sign that's an omen a, a positive omen for anyone that has old material there because you have to you have to think about it teams that got there early they invested a lot in refreshing refarming that entire structure out yeah that's what you got to be able to do you got to get that material back that you spend as well to take it into end game if you don't get the zones that you need as here it is maybe our first chance to see zwitty fizz and toggle in the end game your boy who again you know has been around for a very long time maybe dropping the ego and changing up the strategy finding a different spot to try and land because if they did land weather station either went a lot better and they hit a really good rotate because they are on the complete opposite side of the map for that I mean, I don't know. I think so. They have three Elam, so I have to assume they fought it out and it probably just works for them. But hold up. Low ground team that seems to be in a desperate situation is putting their focus on up. It's Flero, Sanjog, and again, Chris there. Who You can see just from their health how low they are. They are in shambles. Like, those are the most scary teams that you have to avoid. Those are the teams that are going to grief your game, especially when you're setting up for half and half out. You do not want to lose your shields or your material. It's very precious for you right now, and you're going to need it to move forward. And that's what's so sketchy when you look at OC as a region. You have the top teams playing overly aggressive because they're confident to run through anyone. You have the lower teams having to play aggressive because something's gone wrong in their game plan. It really is just about playing defensive and avoiding it or up in the ante and playing even more aggressive. As here we see our first example of the zero points at endgame. Like I said, they're actually a better rotation tool than the sand. Once you get them off, you can jump further. You can It goes for a little bit longer. You can't get knocked or shot out. You can build while doing it. You can shoot while doing it. And that's what comes into its own here as two east teams setting up on the edge of fourth zone like i talked about earlier trying to just hope for that half half zone to pull onto their base so remember sunswick was the one that caught sui as well uh tui oh. as well just before that so that means that he was picked up it was just a knock luckily for tui to be back in this game that's a top five team we're talking about there mammal asto looking into pussy some shots in Sunswick as we were just talking about it's gonna find toggle there oh no not looking good for the Middle Eastern boys who are looking to perform here on OCE right now Fizz being pressure sand jogging company that same shambles trio just nearby will be able to play spoiler and pick up all that extra loot and look it's a max distance draw for everyone involved in the back portion of the zone he said hey you thought this is going to Coliseum no absolutely not it's going all the way back now all the way back, and we have, is this Jay's Vortex and Basil that are getting hit with Storm Surge? I think it is. Yeah, that's the indicator. It's not Cyrex here. They're taking the damage down below. They're not the only team. So as much as we talk about all this aggression from OCE, still so many players alive. 56 players alive. 22 teams right now. So they kind of have to do what they can to jump up right now as Basil's going up for this. They don't have much damage near them, though, because they only have one player on top of them. They're going to have to get max damage onto them if they can. Wait, we just watched some big, big exchanges here. Second versus third place in the feed there. The exchanges are good for Basil, Vortex, and Jace, who find Ronin and Eshes confirmed eliminations in the feed. Don't know if Will's still alive. We will continue to keep an eye on them. Remember, it was 74 points, 72 points, 71 points for the top three teams. That's how close it was coming into this. And already we're watching these big, big teams clash with one another. Big, big teams clashing, and it's all about who's going to get the high ground. You see it there. You see Volks, Sink, and Sorif in the distance. They are going to try and go for this one. Whoever gets first rotating, this is the challenge. Cork putting up the stairs saying, hey, we're not giving this up, but we're also not going to take easy damage from you. So wherever this first rotating zone goes in the next 16 seconds, we'll heavily decide who gets hype. But remember, that is Team Tui on the high ground. That is your RPG rocket team. They have ultimate control. If they don't get first rotating, they can pressure across as we see the pressure falling down onto this team. Vortex going down in the feed. Jace going down in the feed. Storm Surge is proving far too difficult. Yeah, so rough now for Basils. Again, in second place right now. Wants to maintain that lead, but already falling. You know, most of his teammates falling in just inside top 20 teams. They're far. They have a long, long trek to get to those placement points and anything else that's better. Here's Alex Jinx and Worthy, though, looking to make a miracle run out of there. 
you know, terrible start, right? Offsetting their game one with zero points, never seen before for a team of their caliber, a team of their stature, and again, championship level for them, right? We talked about them being one of the most decorated here on the OC region. And I mean, today, you couldn't tell. You really couldn't tell, but can they turn this around? Can they make this a miracle run? Here's that shot Ooh, right there, though. Bouncer oh. RPGs coming out. And uh, I mean, I don't want to call Tui out for this one. Anyone would have seen it yesterday on social media. Tui uh, making a, a questionable play with that bouncer RPG, potentially bouncing into his own RPG. And by I mean that, definitely bouncing into his own RPG. But that was when he was first place in the qualifying rounds, having a bit of fun right now. All focus will be on this one, showing that he can pull it off when it really counts. Defending a bit of the criticism he got here. His son's going to anchor that build on the front side. Tui's going to play the mid layer and try and hold this one off as Cork plays the back layer. And that's their last rocket. I don't know about using it just there, but again, if this team keeps pushing up, I mean, if this zone keeps pushing up on top of Zayt Hill, this is a spot for an end game to end. The Mountain of Mountains, one of the King's Thrones here, but if they can't make their way up on top of it, they are all going to fall. Yeah, if I had to guess, that's just a sign to me that they are feeling Ooh. it right now. They're just vibing out here on high ground, throwing all their resources down. Keep everyone off the mountain. Keep everyone down in shambles to fight one another. Give yourself the distance that you need to maintain the strength of the high ground. Maz on the other side, though, is in a complete opposite situation. Fighting his way through the storm line and through the wood build here. He barely makes it out, but he does have the material. So far in split from his teammate, it's all for himself. It's every man for themselves. Here's Luder on the other side trying to find his squad mate. What a scrappy rotate for them now. Big scrappy rotate. I see DJ down the low ground who was honestly being kind of flying under the radar there. I saw him get that second place, clutch it up there for as a solo. I don't know how many points they're on as Astos team's trying to push through here. And you're still seeing the storm surge active. OCE showing they have aggression, but really showing when the best of the best make it to end game. They know how to rotate. They know what to do to stay alive because that is the third instance of active storm surge this game as Tui trying to find his way back up onto this high ground. I don't see any white meds though, monster. Are we going to see this go back down to a heal off that high ground just kind can't win. There's no way. There's no way because they're running out of mediums as well. So eventually they're going to have to come on down. That's the way I see it right now. That's the way I'm going to call it. But it's still going to come down to a matter of whether or not they decide to do it themselves. And they're just coasting their way here. Now, finally, top 10 is given out. This is looking like a very different game, very different situation for them as they are looking to just, again, pressure. I talked about them not having a medium ammo. I lied. It seems like they <laughs> found a refresher along the way. All of a sudden, everyone is cut back off. They have that firepower that they need to make maintain height. Yeah, someone could have had it. Potentially, maybe a harpoon play there as well as we have Coach Jake. Funny story, Jake actually had a very Zay, uh, similar Zayt-esque retirement that didn't last too long. Only a couple weeks there, found his competitive edge again, is back competing during FNCS, having a bit more fun with it, but still a good performance. 45 points on the board as Mammals here, and here it is, your FNCS three times champion, Jinx, who isn't a noob, but loves to go with the tag here on the low ground, trying to make something happen, has no attempt to go for high ground, as with good reason. Cork, Suns, and Tui are just putting down all the pressure on this one. You have to think if they pick up this dub as well, Monster, that could be potentially a top 10 already secured with two games still to go, and that would be a direct qualification into the semi-final heats. Yeah, no doubt about it. Remember, they're coming from fifth place right now, so again, on the hot streak, on the heels of a great game in the previous run as well. But Jinx is doing that too here. Jinx has literally already doubled, if not tripled the points that he came into this round with. So a fantastic run for the FNCS champ himself as well to go in and swing on back. We talked about DJ being on the uh, the offensive here. No, he's actually fighting back. It's all kinds of messy down low. Everyone falls. We can't even keep track of it. But DJ is a part of the falling team. Mavel's going to find one. Sunswick is down as well. Now Sun gets into the mess here. The higher ground squad, and look at that. They close it out strong. And it's our first team to capitalize on the triple digits, ending on over 100 points. It's Tui's team out of the Hyzera Dam. I talked about him at the start. They were potentially going to be a team that I made for my prediction, but he has juggled through teams. Tui has settled on this team pretty late in the season. They've only been together now for less than a week, but showing it doesn't matter. Triple digits. Yeah, no doubt about it. But listen, the analysts are also going to have some words for this one because that was a ridiculous game. We'll see what they got to say. Let's toss it on over. Oh, I feel like it's going to be more than just a few words, right, Fallout? <laughs> 
I am as verbose as it gets. So yes, absolutely. You know, let's break down the late game there for a little bit, Vandy. Uh, interestingly enough, RPG is the cheat code to get high ground that came to fruition there as Tui was able to grief high ground with the RPG. And then once you have the RPG on high ground, that's pretty much yours to the taking. So the use of the rocket launcher right there, brilliant from Tui, textbook Fortnite, holding that high ground and then collapsing. Very well done. And Timmy, I mean, with that kind of... Um uh, the sorry early game as well like we kind of and even in the mid game everyone was kind of banking on Colossus Coliseum and then of course the zone shifted way away from that I mean how did that kind of impact the final kind of stages of the game yeah so we're going to watch early game here but I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the mid game because that's really where a lot of the, the changes happened as we move towards late games what we saw was what I call POI clustering it's essentially where a bunch of people decide that they're going to go towards something that they feel safe back so they felt safe at Coliseum that's when everyone decides to cluster, and from there they think they can get refreshes off mass, possibly get some extra loot. But what happens is everyone decides the same thing. They get to go uh, to the same spot, and with these huge clusters at these small places, you actually don't get a refresh on anything, really, because there's so many people around you. Now, experienced players, we saw specifically Stick, we saw specifically uh, Scammed and Goeg, people who are really, really good, who understand these, these concepts, Stay away from that area. You see um, Stink and Sorif here playing playing well away from those clusters that we saw over at Coliseum. They understand this. Look at this. This is what I'm talking about. This huge cluster here at Coliseum that they were trying to avoid. So they have to stay away from that, but it's also very, very important that they sort their surge out, making sure they get enough tags to, to satisfy Storm Surge. And that's where the example of Jace, Basil, and Vortex can come in. Jace, Basil, and Vortex avoided the Coliseum um, cluster but they didn't sort their surge out. And in the end, they got taken out as half half started and then basically went into late game, taken out before it could start. Yeah, Storm Surge has been quite the impact here in this final. We saw Brezzo and Culture be the recipients, the poor, unfortunate recipients of Storm Surge in games two and three. Right there, it was Jason Basil, which is surprising because Jason Basil are known to be highly aggressive players that box fight quite aggressively, they key quite aggressively. And despite that, somehow, some way, we're able to find the early game fights that they needed. I also know that they typically dropped Craig Eclipse. They were fighting Craig Eclipse against Redox, Bathan, and Co. They obviously did not fight that early game, which is probably why they ended up facing Storm Surge in that mid to late game, and it ended up costing them. The damage was too strong, and they got taken out outside of the top 10. Yeah, absolutely. As this finishes up here, we saw uh, Pumpkin, Suns, and Cypher coming in second again. Last time it was with high ground. This guy, this time it was through mid the mid ground. So showing their versatility, and then Tui, Cork, and Suns obviously on height with that RPG, finishing it out really easily. Yeah, too easy at that point with Rocket Launcher and High Ground as you see them collapse. We had Suns and Suns both alive in that late game here. <laughs> one with the S and one with the Z is in the end, it was Suns that won, of course, alongside Tui and Cork. A really, really solid game for them. And as a result of that, I believe that puts them in first in the standing. So we don't have the standings to show you all live, but want to give you guys the heads up. Suns, Tui, and Cork in first place with 105 points. Pumpkin and uh, Sunswick and Cypher in second place with 100 points. Third place is Muzz, Looter, and Speedy. That's your current top three. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye on this. So just a side note as well, the reason why we haven't had our leaderboards is just due to a tech issue. But for everyone at home, of course, we will manage to have the final standing. So at the end of match six, we will be able to show you the total standings of the day and the leaderboard, but pay attention to Fallout, of course, who's keeping track for everyone at home. Uh, the next match, of course, match five is ready and underway. So I'm going to throw you back to your amazing casters, Aussie Antics and Monster. Thank you so much. We're jumping back in here. And don't worry, I'll keep you guys up to date with the leaderboard. Like I said, in coming into that game or coming out of it, I should say, Tui's team cracking the triple digit, but we had another team up there. It is Suns, Tui, and Cork in first on 105 points. You have Pumpkin, Cypher, and Sunswick, though, in second on 100, which I don't think too many people would have expected. And then Muzz, Looter, and Speedy on 91. So right now, only one prediction inside the top three right now, Monster. Yeah, no doubt. And then listen, with Pumpkin, though, and Cypher and Sunswick in particular, like they played upset for a lot of the big teams on the come up there. When you saw them lighten up the feed, yeah. they were just picking off either knocking and or finishing some pretty big names. So again, the Dark Horse teams, we kind of talked about it uh, as far as the early game goes of the pre-show leading into this uh, Aussie that we weren't going to know who was going to show up, but we knew someone was going to show up. It could just be them. 
Yeah, and the same time we talked about as well with uh, with Timmy in the pre-show that this is a very cerebral meta, and I love that. It's the fact that there isn't so much rotation items, so those smarter players who know how to position, who often have a lot of experience, like your Zates and other regions, kind of show up and perform here today. And that's what Skype is very well known for. He has been in the competitive scene since before tournaments, since I'm talking squad scrims days. So he has been really popping off there. And I want to see if they can kind of hold the lead coming into game five, because we are ready to jump underway the battle bus is loaded and we are going to be jumping into our second last game of this tournament seeing who can jump forward and take this because right now top 10 is only 52 points monster you can get 30 for a win with no eliminations this is anyone's game to make qualifications into semis you're, you couldn't have put that in a better way, right? Because we've seen even players like Volk's team do that as well. Jinx do that as well, right? Jinx was so far behind, and there's just a couple of good runs. Finding a stride in just one of those games, this entire team has now managed to throw themselves all the way up to a top 15 position here. That's, again, striking distance to break into top 10. It, that's what they're fighting for, ultimately, right? Is at least that top 10, and if not, the series points that come along with it, which again, ultimately that's a discussion in its own, but you still want to knock away that top 10 here if you can today. Looking at the map though, I'm looking at Dirty Docks. I'm seeing that there's a contestion going on there that I don't believe was happening before. So that is kind of interesting. That is very, very interesting. Onto a team that, again, I'm guaranteed is going to make consistency easy into semifinals. Jinx, Alec, and Worthy, but still struggling here on the day. As there you see it, you get a little bit of an indicator on what we're talking about with that rocket, right? So that's what you're going to be getting from Ruckus, which is the NPC at Hydro Dam. You take him down, you get that guaranteed RPG and the legendary heavy assault rifle. Not just that as well. He also, as a ghost, comes back to life, kind of, and sells you lever shotguns or different types of shotguns as well. So this this job spot really being discovered to be one of the strongest on the map and it's not just OCE who believes that you have the you know the very confusing to some but the switch up the Zate Saf and Stretch made leaving Dirty Docks uncontested to claim this drop as their own didn't work too well for them this week in the qualifying rounds but guaranteed to have a similar story to Tui it take it into the finals yeah listen excuse Using the book aside, you know what? They'll come back with a stronger game plan and see how it ends up playing out on the NA side. But hey, for what's going down here, as far as the final stages, right? As you start breaking into this qualifying week one, it's proven to already be the strongest spot as we expected, right? As we expected, Tui Cork and Suns now coming into first place. They're proven just that. They are proven just as we see a team that needs to prove a little bit more. 28 points here on the board inside Pleasant. And they're kind of, you know, having these standoff engagements. A lot of these teams, and it shows the, the lack of confidence. And I don't want to say that in OC because these are the kind of engagements that, that show more intelligence, setting up, maybe waiting for a snipe, trying to get some kind of an engagement. But quite often, more than not, you see the players who take those kind of engagements in OC are struggling. As I say that, though, our ex-FNCS champions in a similar engagement as we have Jinx Worthy and Alex set up here. And this is one thing that'll be interesting this team has so much respect in the region they've pretty much had dirty dogs to themselves since the start they haven't been playing it contested so if anything at least good practice for them here in these qualifying rounds to see what happens if someone does pull a sneak one and come in their last minute yeah, definitely. I am going to be playing close attention to that feed there. Back to Pleasant Park, though. It seems like Asso's putting these shots down from the low ground here, and they are definitely pinned up right now. No heals to work with. Blinks on the other side does have a little bit more, and King, of course, does have the high ground advantage, the natural advantage. The first tag, though, goes to the side of Mammal's team here, so not too bad for the initial start. But Finks and company are going to back up, play it slow, and recoup their position now. And you're trying to recoup the position, maybe recoup some mats as well. 19 builds alone here, and this fight's going to be really prolonged. There's no way to really open this one up, except for maybe a sniper or just a really good AR beam into this fight. They are in zone, so I want to say they have a little bit of time to waste, but not really. This is the fight you see kind of happening on any East a lot again with Pleasant Park. It's just, it's not a very good PY in my opinion, Monster. It doesn't really give you anything. It doesn't have any NPCs ever. It doesn't give you that much loot. It doesn't actually give you that much really of anything. It's good if you get it to yourself but these long prolonged fights are almost never worth it yeah I, I i totally share that sentiment by the way especially if you don't get to that serp truck in time on the rotate out if you don't mm -hmm. get that either like this spot is just a dud across the board so we'll see though a contested drop a drawn out fight it's really just you know lowering both teams chances for what it's worth not an exceptional drop by any means but i guess it's the nostalgia that really draws people to it right 
Yeah, it's a fight that people are comfortable taking. Everyone has gone Pleasant Park at least one time in their engagements as we still have 80, sorry, 98 players alive now as Jinx is pushing into this one, trying to see what they can do to open this one up. That's going to be our second elimination of the game. We've talked all day about OC aggression, but not a single team has gone down yet as our Atwa is back here in this one. Worthy holding them down and that's not a play you want above you. You aren't moving if Worthy has his eyes on you as Worthy builds up for this one now. Jinx and Alec have eyes on this two and never mind just completely deleted there by alec on that one and they're out of here dirty dogs and it shows why they have it uncontested it's for good reason yeah broke them like a cheap pencil right there that team gets snapped up and thrown out just like that that was quick oh uh, hey we, we talked about testing drops and getting a little bit of practice in you know i felt like maybe they would have a disadvantage not having the greatest hot uh hot streak so far of games today but you know no, they completely proved us wrong on that one. They just say, hey, you know, it's, it's, things happen in lead up. But when we're feeling it, we're feeling it. They win that They win that drop like it's nothing, even against, uh, again, the sneaky surprise play there. So well played for them. Yeah, well played for them. I believe that was actually one of the main console contingents coming into OC that was aggressing onto them. So a little bit of confidence there. I don't know how they're feeling with that one. That's a very, very difficult team to drop on. But we talked about a lot more of the mythic metas of, I mean, if you're going to go for a fight, at least go for a fight that's worth the loot. We just talked about Pleasant not really being like that. Oh, as they oh, get dropped oh. out. No clue the big oh, chop. No. You see all those half-edited walls. Clearly that was the play. They got too aggressive. They got too comfortable on their high ground and Asto makes them play pay showing why they are pushing 70 points now if they can as right now the disengage comes out and oh no here it is we have slayer fluxy and radius i talked about teams that when you know it's a good team when they have the confidence this is what it looks like yeah but look it's so unfortunate oh. for this metal yeah it's so unfortunate for you're talking about a top eight top 10 team right now right it's gonna go and exchange though back and forth slayer somehow ends up by himself seems like the Ooh, two pleasant park teams weren't was. happy with slayer and company coming on in and they all start collapsing on top of one another wait a second mammal does clutch up for the squad he finishes off radius and this is massive because the the loot it exchanges it swings into his hands so now someone who's been having a hot hand a hot streak so far gets to save his teammates potentially here I don't think it's going to be our same as teammates, though. I see another trio pushing in from that north side of Pleasant. Who is this right now? Mammal's in this one. Trying to have this 1v1. Oh, in. no. Mammal. Was that a he oh, headshot snipe there? There it is. There's another player pushing in. Who is this, though? I didn't quite see it. Is it... Wait. That wasn't Forbes, was it? No, it wasn't. Here we go. It's Basil, Vortex, and Jace pushing into this fight as well as Bathan's team. What is going on? Pleasant Park is not worth this. It's not worth the positioning. It's not worth the loot right now as Jace is going to fall back here. And now we have another full-on trio engagement building up and reinforcing on what is essentially the ruins of the previous engagement. Yeah, they, they rolled up in here thinking it was going to be a free Elon, but seeing that how the metal came out, I think that was a good enough indicator to say, all right, these guys are in a power position. They clearly still have some really great resources, so they're going to back on off and not take the fight, not throw their chances of their top five slotting already. Remember, in this tail end in these games, this is game number five, only two more rounds of Fortnite in front of them. They just have to coast through for a top 10. Yeah, I got to try and coast into that top 10. That's what it means for a lot of these players. Most of these guys would be sitting pretty comfortable at getting in off consistency as well because that's how this format works. You're actually getting triple the amount of teams and players are going to get in off consistency than getting that top 10. And maybe that's where a lot of this aggression comes from in OCE. This is going to be the first FNCS that doesn't have two heats. It actually has four. So opening up even more spots through qualifying in each week, but also through consistency. So it's going to be a little bit interesting if we see a snipe coming out there somehow mm. finally some purchase a bit of damage there as this fight is going to be a big one on a big height and i guess they're on a pretty good side of zone to have this fight they're pretty far away from everybody else but it's dragging out again yeah and this is just outside the pleasant park so just you know just <laughs> south of the stronghold here it seems to be a hot spot on oce right now Dan Jock, someone we've seen fight multiple times today already. Not necessarily on the winning side of the barrel each time the engagements happen, but we can see what credit him can do now. Again, this is a team that's at the bottom of the totem pole right now. They don't want to be here. At the very least, they can continue to play their hearts out right and be content with at least scoring some, some of that series points we talked about to making their way to the heats.
And obviously with players and teams already qualifying in one of the earlier weeks and not being able to play uh, existing weeks after that, we always talk about how players in different regions especially like to alpha their jobs. And that could be a little bit of what this is. Hey man, you guys are higher on the points. We're not making it this week, but neither are you. So we're going to see you next week and we're both going to be dropping here again. So even though those players qualify and they can't play again, players that do get to play again or will see each other in the heats needs to have these engagements as they've seen the shots, guys. Tax shotguns, please. There it is. The high fire sometimes makes you look bad. You can't connect the shots. And they do. Grav is now down on the low ground by himself. Only one elimination on the board. But again, that was a team on a high 40 points. They were close to making that top 10 right now. They went into this game sitting around just outside top 10 in about 12th to 13th. So pretty sad to see two of the teammates go down as Grav has a chance to outright qualify this week. Yeah, no doubt about it. But, you know, nothing wrong with a little pillow fight on high ground, right? A little back and forth there. The tag shot. Here it is. Up to a repost, though. Again, looking to carry their way to the top of the standings just off of the Elims alone. They already have six in this game. Here's Toggle, the ME the ME trio of Zuati and FZ. Again, rotating off that weather station nice and late there. Sanjog and Cred are going to finally find out that last men, uh, member of HVT. And now... Hopefully they've managed to pick up Flero's reboot card because they're going to have to pick him up inside of the Pleasant Park, which should be vacant by now, but who knows? It is OCE, of course. There could still be that fight going down with all those other trios. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fights always breaking down as Repulse's team is back in this one. Didn't see they went pretty quiet for the last few rounds here as Repulse still up. Tyrax and Forbes go down, and when they're in it, they're in it with a bang. Six eliminations on the board. As now we're going to see Caller try and make their way into this one. I think this is a different fight. No, same fight there. Repulse is looking a little bit weak. Going to try and go for the revive. There is multiple teams here, and there it is. Luna, Speedy, and Muzz just seem to always find themselves near Repulse as Repulse is on the back foot. He's got two full trios near him, one disengaging, but either way, that is a 1v3, and I expected to see it. Orzo taking down Repulse in the top left. SPG Repuck, they're going to be out of it. They've got one more game to put it all together, and I honestly think they're one of those teams that's just going hyper-aggressive to get the experience. They're not too worried about their performance today. Yeah, unfortunately, Orzo was just the better mechanical, uh, or the better aimer, I should say, in that position. Not, not mechanical, but he was just winning the gunfight toe-to-toe -to -toe there with the repulse and that's why he does manage to take him out because repulse got the exchange he got one of the knocks and in that 1v1 had he just bested that player there orzo it would have been a different story but okay back with looter speedy here now they have the mountain again weeping woods a very interesting place to play around all the trees here blocks line of sights ambushes can happen so you really do have to be cautious and that's why they're not necessarily rushing their way through the draw spot instead they're waiting for those teams that they already knew were fighting just outside the zone seeing if they can hold them out maybe cut them off from the rotate pace here though med kit in hand has to make a big move too yeah they need the white meds right now they've got the slurp fish they got three of them actually so the time spent in zone was time spent fishing but it's kind of a waste if you have to then eat them all to get back the health that you've lost in storm making the late rotate as we do have scammed Zalker and Goeg here trying to make something of this game as well. And this is where it's going to start kind of solidifying who is going to be in the top 10. Two more games to put it all together. Teams like this, like Ludamuz and Speedy, I think are almost guaranteed for sure going to be qualified, which means this is going to be your last two games to get a chance at looking at them until we make it to the semifinals. Yeah, it's going to be hard to overthrow a team that, you know, kick this off with the first win of the day and then basically hasn't fallen out of the top 15 ever since. Not to mention they're catching big Elims in the last couple rounds of, you know, if, if it's a sign of anything is shown that they are heating up seven Elims in the previous and seven before that as well. So again, they're feeling their game right now. They're really feeling their position in this tournament at 91 points already holding their top three and the margin is getting deeper, right? It's getting further and further away from the other players. So if they can continue to pop off the way they are, they'll be long gone and, you know, I guess safe inside of the top 10 here. Yeah, and it's going to start spreading out more. And that's what, again, that skill discrepancy kind of lends to in OCE to really spread out the leaderboard like that. As Spraz, Pace, and Remy, a team that struggled, but mostly just because of drop spot contention. I can't see that happening in future weeks. They will be a team that shows what they can do when they get their drop spot and they actually get to play out the game like they want. I don't think they expected to have a full trio dropping on them at Weather Station. So again, trying to make something out of this is Ryzer, Cyrex, and Morph going to make their rotate as well. Weeping Woods, a good spot to make this kind of on-foot rotate through 
It's up river, but you've got all the trees for cover. You've got a little bit extra loot lying around as well. Maybe some excess from some fishing in there as Spraz's loadout looking very, very shambles for this team that's rotating near them with instead having two slurp fish in the back pocket. I was going to say, you know, it's a tough situation when you got to dig into the make it and the surface just to get out of the zone. Talking about tough situations, Toggle here, that weather station fight. You know what? He, he did that just to deny the Elam if I had to guess anything at all, because we did see Remy and company still alive making their rotates late. But, you know, again, they made their rotates and they got out safe. So Toggle just try to de deny, right? Deny the Elam's, deny the points. Still a valid strategy. Either here nor there, though. The zone pushing further and further north this time around. It's a grassy ending, not necessarily the desert one like we saw before. Yeah, it's one of the first kind of more vanilla end games I want to say. There's always been a little bit to make those end games exciting. Bit of water, bit of sand, bit of something. But right now, this is a very, very yeah vanilla area of the map. It's all it's all flat. There's a few hills, but definitely no mountains by any means. A couple of interesting spots to set up though, as we have Dana setting up on the edge here. Mazda's team rotating through, and you see the amount of con con like congestion here on that very edge. It's one of those big huddles of zones. Zone three, one that you do usually want to go a little bit more center than this, because then you can try to go to the edge of fourth like we've already talked about but when you've got this many teams holding in front of you sometimes you just got to set up where you can set up yeah you got to take what you can take and that's kind of how the australian players do tend to do it you just sit up they get comfortable no matter who is nearby and that south portion right there is a determining factor it's a basically proof in the pudding there to show just that and this is what the drones watching here pace remy and king who had the latest rotates here Zedox was already sitting here for quite some time. You can see their base is fully situated, to say the least. Now, the, who's going to move first? Little bush check there. The safety play. I think there's a trio in that bush. Oh, no. If not, they might be in the base nearby. Never mind. The map was deceiving for a second. I was going to say, what a lucky just <laughs> random bush check. Like, if you would have just hit the shot. You can imagine sometimes you never know that you got to take the shots. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And sometimes with snipers, that's what it counts. Some people have been discussing what they can do to snipers to, you know, stop it from being just taking shots at everything because there's been some games just won and lost over some very lucky and just very fortunate shots. But you might as well go for it. There's next to no risk as right now, Bates and Zedox have to follow this rotate. Luda, Muzz, and Speedy trying to figure out what they're going to do as well. They've been hiding behind a lot of these builds to get to this point. How they're going to make the next part of the rotate speedy, choosing to build, use a little bit of mats, investing especially the hard mats into the metal, knowing they have a team from behind. And Speedy, Muzz, and Looter are happy just to set up on the low ground, take their base, build it out of hard mats, maybe farm their way into this one, but I don't think it's to play too aggressive. I think they're just trying to claim those walls and make sure they stay safe. Yeah, this is just the start of something great for this team here. We'll see how they can continue to play as the qualifying weeks rage on. A lot of different teams now we're seeing getting a piece of the action here. Ryza, Cyrex, and Morph. I'll play for a little bit of high ground here, hoping that the next half and half out favors them. They're actually underneath the damage threshold, though, and 18 players have to go down. Probably the, the most staggering that we've seen so far. This is going to be a rough one for everyone. Just take a look at the drone shot here, show you how the map is basing out. No one wants to base up in the middle there. That'll be the targeting fest for anyone if the pushing and mushing does begin. You can see one of the only teams there that's probably looking to be okay is Cypher, Pumpkin, and Sunswick here, who are so high up on the standings. They're dead center right now. Yeah, 102 points on the board. I think they're pretty much already guaranteed to qualify, but still might as well go for the victory lap now. Make it assured. Get your qualification the first week as Riser falls here. A whole bunch of damage coming out. Now they pick him up. They're 10 below the Storm Surge, and it's going to start ticking very, very soon in 10 seconds. I don't even know if it's worth picking him back up. You're going to have to try and get some damage. It's not that far below, but the time spent on that, he might just instantly go down to Storm Surge unless they time this one properly as Trixie and Edge are... Uh, fault down the low ground the spg contingent trying to do something as ronan eshes and will have really fizzled out here tonight monster yeah they definitely just hit that red light like i like to say man they're parked up there and they're they're having a bit of a struggle time they were at 71 points after two games of fortnite and then now three games later only at 75 so very very rough Speaking about rough, man, Storm Surge is unforgiving. You can see how many teams are getting targeted now. Everyone's getting blazed down by the Storm Lightning Bolts from up above. Stop to forget, though, the players can't see these effects. They can only hear them nearby. And, you know, honestly, most of the times, just the sound cues enough are enough for everyone to uh, go ahead and focus you. 
Yeah, it's definitely not as visual as the giant lightning bolt from the skies, but that's honestly <laughs> what it is right now. You are being cursed. You need to do something to get above it. It's that kind of mechanic that's set in the game to create some action, to make sure that you're always looking for damage. You're not just boxing up and sitting there and doing nothing. You're trying to make moves and you're playing smart. You're not playing overly aggressive, but you can't just sit behind your full build wards and hide as Jake is trying to do something here. Sums Cork and Tui, our first place team on 109 points up here in a decent position again, seeing what they can do right Right now they've still probably got that rocket in hand i can't see how they would have lost it but they have to drop off the high ground that's been so instrumental in their success so far today but with the rockets they can always take it back whenever they want if they play it well yeah no doubt about it here it is though muzz speedy and looter on the low ground where they like to be most you can see suns is just nearby on the other side of the wall so here it is another big exchange third and first place so close to one another neck and neck in the competition already who can go ahead and make that victory lap like you mentioned do it for the glory right do it for the shows just to say you go ahead you know you have what it takes right these these lobbies honestly ozzy if you really think about it they're about equivalent to what could be the grand finals honestly they'll probably mirror the grand finals in a lot of the different ways right like we're just getting a taste of what's going to come for the finals weeks as these uh, qualifying go on, as the heats come through. And that is where it will be as well. A lot of players, again, no money in these qualifying weeks. So a lot of these teams are going to be playing this one very differently to how you know they're going to play the grand final. And that's where it is the best of the best stepping up with everything on the line, where every engagement, every move, every fight matters, where a lot of these guys are going to be banking on, oh, I'm going to qualify anyway, which I guarantee is going to bite some players. You need to take this seriously. This is FNCS for a reason right now as the damage comes out. And this is a team that's definitely taking it serious. They have the high ground, 18 points. This could be the big deciding factor for this team qualifying because with this performance so far, they don't get to rest on the confidence in preceding weeks. They need to take their chance to qualify now and getting gifted high ground like this is going to be their opportunity. Yeah, definitely on the low ground though. Speedy is going to get taken out, caught off guard. And now it's up to Looter and Muzz to play with one another, operate with one another on high ground though. Taker and WP, you see here, of course, holding it down right now. Sunswick on the other side though, looking to start gathering some points here. Only a single Elim for them. So that's not enough to close the gap of the other trios that are already finding a bunch. And look, Looter's going to find more in the feed there. The Mako trio still up as well. It's going to find Sword there. So big knocks for him. And it seems like Volks is still alive too here as Looter finally gets traded out now. So again, that Rampage on the back uh edge line there, not enough. Not enough to keep him alive here now. Not enough to keep this one going as they're pushing forward, doing really well, and they see another high ground, an existing base to anchor to, and that is massive when you're trying to hold those high grounds on those long open tops. As here we go, our second place team trying to make their way through. What can Sunswick do as a solo? And look at that big top. They haven't dropped down and reinforced it too much along the way, and that's why that pressure's probably going to start coming out. But everyone's scrambling to get ahead of this zone. They haven't had time to look up. As you see Sunswick right now scrambling up against the walls. Surely he runs into someone soon, but he's controlling these layers so well just making his way through, ratting his way through, as we often say, just trying to use as little material as possible. And he rats onto the wrong wall and Remy catches him right there with that one, takes them down. Remy and Spraz trying to get their points back up. Now they've managed to get their drop spot. They've managed to get to end game and they want to show why they are one of the most dominant teams in OCE. Yeah, no doubt about it, but it's high ground who will be able to win this last one if they continue just to walk their way through and let everyone do all this hard work for them. Here's Eshes, though. Eshes and Ronin, they had such Ooh. a rough time. 94 points now. He gets greeted with a huge slap to the face there as he walks through that wall. And okay, they fall, but they fall at 95 points. Much, much better game than anything they've had up until this point. Remember, they were the leaders coming into this. They were a team to look out for, and all of a sudden they had a rough, rough run in but it's okay you can toss a game or two you can still do very very well with just four great games of fortnite and they can scratch this off to be as one of the better ones the last game will determine a lot for that squad and Basil, Vortex, and Jace trying to take that first place one. I vouched for them earlier in the stream for why I knew the they would be a team that qualifies for the finals. They are fifth place going into this, and they are racking up the eliminations, racking up the points, and a team, DJ, that surprised a lot of people yesterday coming second in the round three, showing that it wasn't a fluke, doing really, really well here today. Sorif is still in the mix as well somewhere, I believe, or could have maybe fallen at this point. It is, we have three teams left, eight players alive. This is the big placement now. Who can get that second and first 
first because that will 100% be the deciding factor of who qualifies as Kazuki on the low ground gets the damage, takes down Jay, says no. Ozzy said you're the kings of low ground. We're going to take the crown here and take her on the high ground. They are having the game of their life right now to try and qualify from this one. Jumping up from, I think, 12 points at the start of this game, Monster. Yeah, definitely. And the difference between second and first is a pretty massive one as well. Not to mention the Elims that come with it. So let's see if they can go ahead and win this one. The low ground peak was good, but it should be enough here as it's a 3v2 situation. And Vortex is by himself. No HP. Basil tries to basically deny the siphon, walk away and go for the heals. But I don't know if it's going to be enough here, Ozzy. I don't know. He's still got four splashes in the flopper, showing that you can never pull it off. But the problem is he only has three builds. If he had more builds to try and make his way in, we talked about he went for the heal off too early, but this could be it. The splash is on top of zone. Can Basil play spoiler? He is qualified. He doesn't need this, but no, the low ground team says we need it more. They jump up massively on the points here. Taker's team having just quintupling their points, I think. I'm not sure going into that game with eliminations worth two and that huge win was worth so much. Maybe the analysts know how many points they went into that game on, but that could have just secured them qualification. So break it down for us, guys. That was ridiculous. It seemed again like Kite was going to be the name of the game. I mean, how did you feel about that one, Fallout? The end game yeah. kind of played out the way we expected, but with a slight exception. That's exactly right. It was cookie cutter late game Fortnite height wins games and it came true right there. But really the story for me was for the second time you actually saw Basil, Vortex and co dominate the late game by just W King sticking together, wolf packing and diving into boxes that played out really, really well for them. They got a, a few eliminations. Basil went a little bit too early for the heal off win that actually should have worked or would have worked based on his inventory. He had three floppers, maybe even four and chug splashes, but he just went a little bit too early there, I think to me. Yeah, definitely. And again, I'm going to talk to mid game. So I think one thing that is really, really important to note about this mid game, we saw clustering once again. It might have been as obvious as as what we saw last game at Coliseum, but this game we saw it at Weeping. Now, now, why why are we getting clusters at Weeping? You might ask. The reason is is subconscious safety is what I like to call it. People who feel safe at a particular POI for, for different reasons, right? So they feel safe at, at, at Weeping because there's so much wood around them. They can easily refarm. Um, you can build your way. So basically you, you, make, you can make a full tunnel and just farm as you go. And that is a huge reason as to why we saw um, 62 people alive at half half. But as we go through these these um, these fights through mid ground here, it, it's mid, -ground, mid game here, sorry. It's, it's basically just 50 50s. And then all of these clusters that appear through Weeping is what actually made the difference in late game. Yep. I think you're spot on, of course, with the cluster in there. And then, as we did mention, late game, well, high ground was maintained throughout the entirety, but we saw a lot more mid-game aggression. This was a little bit overall, though, in comparison to past games of the slower game, a bit of a, a slower mid-game. And as players, of course, in game number five are starting to really focus on how they can qualify into that top 10. And Ozzy asked us, he said, hey, casters let us know basil vortex jace did they secure themselves a spot in the semifinals? well not just yet they're currently in seventh place with 81 points 10th place is district bantis and gusos with 63 points so if they fall asleep here in game number six if they get taken out uh, again by zedox bathan and co this is not a guaranteed qualification just yet for basil vortex and jace despite their consistency they've had a game or two where they got taken out early and they're gonna have to perform here in game number six timmy yeah, absolutely. And as I spoke about just before, 62 players alive at half-half. And look at that clustering through South. That is a huge, uh, huge function of basically everyone deciding that uh, Weeping is a safe place to be. And then from there, it was all about everyone making that rotation in half-half. We see Luda Muzz playing through mid-ground really nicely. But the mid-ground masters, it's all about base. Uh, Jace, Basil, and Vortex controlling space. What I like to call snowballing. Basically getting an Elam, getting the Siphon mats, getting another Elam by controlling space, controlling more space with the Siphon mats, controlling more space, controlling more space. And as you control space late game, more Elams come, more and more Elams come. So they, they yep. put on an absolute clinic. And then as you'd expect, guys on height, basically getting a free win. Yeah, that's exactly right. Obviously, the Siphon mats on top of the refresh coming through from inventory, that's going to be enough to help them snowball in that late game. But you're right, uh, W, Puck, and Co. They earned high ground. They deserved high ground. And as a result, they got a win. That might help them in the standings. That might help them sneak into that top 10. But so far, it's been the Vortex Chase show as uh, actually Sorif and, uh, and Volks and Sinky are going to be the ones that are currently in first place. 
pretty awesome to see. But like you said, we're going to have our top 10 revealed after this next game. We've got one more qualifier match to bring you. And of course, Aussie Antics and Monster will be your casters for this. So guys, for the final time today, please take it away for us. The final time of the day. And yes, it is incredibly close to the top. We do have a team potentially pulling away. And I mean, I talked about it. I said I was maybe going to call them as my prediction. I said after game two when they were struggling, there is no way this team doesn't make finals. And they are guaranteed already in first place. Basil Vortex and Chase on 124 points, Monster. Yeah, and that last game was a big, big one. So they came off of a first, a 13th, and now a second place again. Just Ooh. consistency. And there was only that one bad game. It was that 30th on second. And you yep. did call it. So they, they're popping off, man. And they, they have this, the minutes alive to really show it. Yeah, they do. And again, we got second place, Sorif, Volks, and Sink, who was my prediction, just saying, currently holding it down for the predictions. I don't do the best on predictions in other regions, so I'll take it on my hometown. There in 115, you have Sorif, Volks, and Sink, but they're tied for second. You have Tui, Suns, and Cork also on 115, so it's incredibly close, but all eyes are going to be on that top 10. Who is going to secure that qualification? Who's going to automatically go through to the heat? Because some of the teams are going to be really looking out for that, especially that pop-off game we just just saw from our high ground team. They really jumped up. I'm trying to see exactly where they jumped up to on the leaderboard, but that was a huge one. They jumped up into 10th, exactly 10th on 63 points. So they really needed that game. That just shows you one big victory royale. Like that's how close the standings are. Yes, it's very top heavy for the rest of the points, but down at the bottom, like for 10th, 9th and 8th, it is a claw through. Like anyone can actually fight for those bottom placement points. I think everyone else up above that from Will, Ronan and Esch's consistency that last game is probably enough now to go in and make them, uh, you know, just have enough to go in and qual through here today too. But it is, again, depending on where they stand as far as their elims and their final placements here in this last game, this is the last round now game six is on the way for qualifying week number one Yes, it. Game six is underway, and we see Oatly, Raptor, and Prizzy taking their spots at Slurpy Swamp uncontested. They're breezing their way in as we see a very interesting engagement in the top left of the map here. We have a lot of teams dropping onto Shark right now. I'm not really sure what's going on there. Teams that weren't there previously, and again, a lot of teams over it. Dirty Dogs. I think we have currently Breslow, Culture, and Bridge aren't there, but Worthy, Jinx, and Alec are very contested. Potentially that same uh, console-based team from the game before that they did wipe rather quickly so we'll see how they go here if it's round number two yeah definitely you can see that there's so many players now again just looking to continue the clashes on the draw spots like we already watched after the initial kickoff here in the bottom of your screen it is worthy down there at the dirty docks already touched down tug splash in hand the fact that we already dropped one is just showing that they're trying to be passive and safe with the plays and look he has to get away from the edge line there there's an enemy there already Little shots come out. Great white tag for Worthy. So far, so good. At the same time, we have Worthy now trying to see what they can do to make this fight. Try and engage into on this one inside Dirty Docks. And it's not playing out quickly. They're going to play it out slow. They they pretty convincingly wiped this team last game. But Worthy, Jinx, and Alec are known for not like kind of developing those kind of egos to just make those stupid pushes. They're a reason why they're one of the most consistent teams. Worthy and Jinx being two of the definitely most consistent players in OCE for a reason. Here's Muzdell swinging things around with Looter and Speedy again. Great round for them last time around. This Elam here already bumps them up to 99. Now, breaking into that triple digits. Can they, again, close the gaps here, break into top five, hold down that top five, and otherwise secure this top 10 performance here. This qualifying week one is so important for a lot of these teams to just go ahead and ease up the pressure and then allow players to just hyper-focus on the heats, hyper-focus on how they're going to go and play this out and really, you know, optimize their strategy, right? Like, perfect it for coming in and hopefully secure themselves a free drop. Yeah, securing a free drop here, and it's looking like this round two is going to go the same way as it did last game. It's looking like a clean sweep, unless something big changes there. We'll keep our eyes on the feed as we have another fight going down here over Sweaty, and that's an important fight over Dirty Dogs. That could be the difference between Jinx, Alec, and Worthy qualifying or not. They're currently in 14th place, struggling a little bit in today's tournament, but a good game here, especially if they get these six points, because three eliminations were six points in this format, and the Storm Surge, so we'll have to see as we're getting our quick stat here. Worthy and 
Sync are tied for the most total victory hours in FNCS Grand Finals with six. And that is ridiculous. Worthy, obviously, being one of the most consistent players. And crazy to think Jinx being the three times FNCS champ doesn't hold that one, but he's just so consistent. Not about the wins, it's about just pure consistency, as can Worthy prove the Worthy aim that everyone in the region knows he has. And there it is. Gets the final shot and takes them down. That is 2-0 a dirty dogs for the FNCS champs. Yeah, and like it, like you said before, more importantly, that's six points that they desperately, desperately need. And it's not like one of those other fights like we lost in the previous round over at Pleasant Park that was drawn out and holding, you know, the teams back. Instead, this does the exact opposite. It actually just gaslights them to do even better because they get the free early siphon and get to continue their loot path. But talking about those big draw spots in that northwestern part of the map, we're back with the Stronghold. This is a big fight, a fight that's going to reset the team complete opposite what we watched happen in 30. And right now, if any team goes down and they're below 63 points, like Spiker here, they are guaranteed to not make top 10. That is 100%. They are outside the top 10 because they're already outside and we're going into our final game. So Spiker needs to survive here if he wants to automatically qualify into those semifinals. But he has a solid team beneath him who's been a little bit quiet tonight. Osiris has been around for such a long time in the OCE scene, hoping to have a big performance here, maybe qualify himself in this final game. But it's going to start by taking down Spiker and I'm sure they're going to do that. It's just a matter of time. Or can he maybe get out of here? Yeah, he's by himself. So it's a matter of time. They're breaking all the builds here. They're trying to see if they can flush him out. Even this cone, but he doesn't flinch. It doesn't build or anything like that. Stick still. And that might just be enough to fake these guys out. So Ooh. lobby run, not no. over just yet. They lost him. No. Oh, there it is. Never mind. Osiris spines and builds up right on his head. Spike is going to try and 1v3. This would be the clutch of a lifetime here if he could try and do this for his team to guarantee that he's got three players and not just any three players, three very solid players on his walls. And they're just really taking it. Wait. Wait, wait. One of them went down to fall damage. Wait. This is this is possible. This is very, no. very Did possible. Did he see this? I don't think he saw. One of them went down to fall damage. I'm gassing you up, guys. You can't do this. OCE finally got an official broadcast. That can't be your moment, please. <laughs> it might have been, though, as Kevin's moment is now over. District lands the sniper shot from behind. A cheeky, cheeky one as he manages to look in. And oh, Mako's one and only goes down there. Oh, and another Mako goes down. So Botlin and Kuma down. Mako just getting absolutely uh, picked apart here, if you will, over at Sweaty Sands. And they've been fighting this fight for quite some time, right? Since game number one, the Sweaty Sands fight has gone back and forth between these two teams. We saw the most questionable engagement between them at the start of this all. We weren't quite sure what we were looking at. And now coming in, as the rounds have progressed, the fights have became, I guess, more and more intense, more and more personal for both teams, right? It, this is holding back nothing here. Yeah, it's holding back absolutely nothing. It's the last game. You've got to leave it all out there on the line. This isn't a 12-game format like you're going to get for the Grand Finals. This is a six-game format to make everything happen. But we saw it last game. One big performance can be what you need. And I do have eyes on my on that feed monster. I'm looking for Taker, LZQM, and WPuck to see what they're making out of this game as we have another big engagement over Coliseum. This is definitely being a hot spot for contention for a bit of fun here for these players as a Slayer, Radius, and Fluxy have been taking a lot of fun here on the edge and Brezzo's making their way in here and Brezzo's been struggling today though let's see what he can do here we've already seen him lose this fight at Coliseum before the Coliseum just has seemingly become such a hot spot for battles you can see how many other teams are still just posted up nearby on the other side of the wall it's actually Cypher's trio that is just over there on the other side of the base but hold up though it looks like this fight's going to be Extended out and then disengaged off of and back to the old builds for Brezzo and company here. Now they start to get back in and reevaluate the situation. Just judging from Brezzo's loot, you can see that he really doesn't have much to work with. Doesn't have a lot to work with here as Mako's team is having the same fight over Sweaty time and time again. It is the same thing, right? The definition of insanity is making is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I don't know how they think this fight's gonna go any differently because every time it ends like this, they either go down in the fight at Sweaty or they go down as soon as they leave Sweaty. As Cynical's trying to make their way through this inside a box of the enemy's builds, unfortunately, can't keep progressing forward. Had a nice little stair phase in there and looks like it's gonna be a 3v1, I believe. 
surely the team Mako can do something here to stop Cynical in a 3v1 as all the aggression was being put out. Only has four builds. Even if Cynical can take down one here, that would be such a monumental effort in a 1v3. Yeah, I'll be honest. He has the health advantage, so one good siphon is going to be enough. Blues is going to fall to the feed for sure to the storm here, and if he finds him, that's all over. The other teammate also lit up as well, so I think Cynical can actually do this, and look, he's going to go for the reboot van here. This is the perfect bait situation. They have to pause and train save one another because they don't have white heels, and look, they can't even hear the actual reboot going on. They're just outside of the earshot of it, so he's going to be able to fully commit, but no, Cynical actually tries to go for the fake. Okay, never mind. Things are just catching up. He actually gets it off even better for him now. Uh, I don't even know what this is. Are they just going to have a gentleman's agreement to now rotate? They're going to stop having this ridiculous storm fight. They've had almost every single game today that has Wait, just card. yielded no results and he's going back for another... Are they going to fight now? They're going to fight now. Never mind. Who cares about rotating again, Monster? You're going to learn this is the way of OCE. You rebeat your teammate in Storm. You have a clear rotator zone and you don't take it. You jump oh, in no. on 18 HP to see if you can make something happen here. This can actually work out well for him. This can actually work out because he will get the siphon here shortly. Oh, there it no. is. The 60 comes in. So he does get the grant extension here to continue the fight. Blues gets hit with one. He tries to go for the edit. He read it like a book, though. He oh. was ready, but not ready enough. Kuma does manage to finish things up. And hey, they're keeping it interesting here for the last game of the day. Oh, and it's been interesting from start to finish. If we know how to do anything, we know how to take our storm fights. And unfortunately, doesn't pull that one off there as Radius down here inside the Coliseum in the area of the, the part of the map that I just hate fighting in. Normally, there's a whole bunch of weird walls here you can't build in, but never mind. Looks like Brezzo, our culture, and Bridge have just wanted to kind of clear this one all out, make their own little box fight arena against Slayer, Fluxy, and Radius, who've just been so aggressive all the time tonight. So, not really sure who has the advantage in this one. It's a pretty close fight, pretty risky one. It looks like Cypress teams just hanging out nearby in Coliseum, not really wanting to make too much of a move on this. Maybe just happy to sit on the edge. Looks like they're making their way over, na over now. I'm just not entirely sure what this fight is. Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's just last game, right? It's the last game kind of shenanigans that goes down. It's just very much expected. And look at how many teams are here. Again, I like to do these little head counts whenever we see them. Three, six, nine, twelve. Another four-way battle at the Col uh, Colossal Coliseum, similar to what we saw in that game four. Kind of fly through and run through so many teams that like to battle out here. Here's our knock and company looking to do the same as well. Back with, okay, Remy King, who do like to land. What is it? The weather station? They're coming oh, yeah. in late. And this is a lazy lake battle. This yeah. is the warpath that they're on. It's on to Suns, actually. It was at the top of the standings. They might want to just qualify right here, right now. Not leave it down to another week. I talked about how good they are. I wasn't saying that for no reason. They are a solid team who just unfortunately had a team they didn't expect to qualify. Obviously, a team they're not used to versing when it comes to their pro scrims because they're a team from an entirely different region out of Middle East. And now Suns is trying to rotate and run from this one. Spraz trying to make his way in, and he does. Spraz as with the tax shot gets the elimination on the G502, the G502 King himself, and he's going to make the rotate out. And they're pushing to get top 10 after a very shaky start monster. It was 63 points going into this game. With a good top three, they could easily do this. Yeah, no doubt about it. And you know what? Respect to Suns, uh, uh, X2, and of course, Quirk, who's going to finish in third as of right now. Again, solid placement for them. That should be enough to definitely secure their way to a top 10 and push their way through to the uh what would be the heats in coming up but we'll see how that all goes out here's Fluxy on the other side again just pop it off here up to cypher these are some huge huge knocks this is a team that had no points finally now gets him a little something before he goes for the evening all right you know something's better than nothing man at least it didn't end at the very very bottom with nothing yeah, nothing going on here as well as they're going to try and do something if they can. Got next to no loot. Slayer drops. This is just such a ridiculous fight here. There's got to be some kind of grudge. There's going to be some beef. There's got to be something involved. Anyone watching at home, OCE finally got their first broadcast. I guarantee you this is not what every game looks like. I have no idea what fight is going on here. As Coliseum just seems to be this proving ground where a bunch of teams are coming to settle their disputes and seeing what they can walk away with as we have more Cyrex now looking like they maybe have the upper hand here. Fluxy's not out though. Six peppers, three splashes with the double blue on the AR and shotgun. That's not a bad loadout, but doing a solo is going to be tough. Yeah, and I mean, listen, they just took on the fourth place team of Pumpkin, Cypher, and Sunswick, and 
Now they pretty much wiped the floor with them. So not too bad, you know, a two for two special there. Keeping it nice and clean and, you know, kind of settling the score, if you will. Here, though, Pace King and Remy, you talked about them having a realistic chance to rocket up the standings. They can still do it. They've already taken out a top placing team. They've already shown that they can, you know, basically drop some of the best this lobby has to offer. But you just need things to go their way. Are things going to go their way this time around? One good victory royale is enough to put you into top 10. We just watched it happen last game, Ozzy. We just watched it happen, and we've got six games, the final game of today, to see how this storyline pans out. Who's going to jump up into the qualifiers and who's going to fall down a little bit short? Mammal, Asto, and Omido in the weird spot here. 74 points, so looking like they're decently clear of qualification, trying to take shots in on the big boys. Not really the big boys here today, though. Alec, Jinx, and Worthy, but they're in a center zone spot that's looking really good, and they do take out the gas can, but the shots come back, but they've got plenty of meds in the back pocket to try and close this one out. And we're going to get a Decently interesting zone here for the end game monster. A little bit of desert again, a little bit of sand, a little bit of water, a little bit of green. So we got a mix of everything we've seen so far here today and seen if any of these teams can put that mixture together and find a recipe for success because top 10 the chance to do it. Yeah, no doubt it's time to brew yourself a nice little potion to take home the victory here. We'll see if it will all come together for these trios here now. And again, just look at the zone. Nice, perfect zone right here to... Be right in the middle of where this, I guess, the river splitting everyone up here, kind of piecing people up, divvying the players out, evenly distributing them to each of the respective lands. The way the, I guess, the height plays here is too bad, right? Maybe just out in top, but it's nothing crazy. So it's very much a flat zone. Players can see eye to eye with one another. I'm hoping though that it does pull to the desert. Looks like a little bit more favorable. It's normal terrain as opposed to that indestructible bridge. It's be very, very interesting. Yeah, and Fluxy and Brezzo are still having their storm fight. I was looking at it on the top of the map on the left there. It looks like Brezzo just beat Fluxy out there at the very end. We have 58 players alive, 22 teams, so quite a few players in this one still going strong. Brezzo walks away from the Coliseum victorious. The solo himself, who came out on top of the Coliseum that was the last Australian Open, 100 of the best solo players in the world brought together, and Brezzo walked away victorious in that, and he's walking out with this, but... I don't think it's going to be as uh, as exciting as his last AO victory is. I'm pretty sure this is his second time here on the AO broadcast. He's potentially going to come to an abrupt end, maybe. The Peppers being instrumental here in the rotate. Going to have one big pot, so getting him to a, a potential of 78 combined health here. And it's a long rotate to make as a solo. Yeah, I'm actually surprised. He gets tagged for Weiss, and the team didn't even finish the deed there. Luckily for them, he, he must have. They must have not have had, like, ammunition actually finish. Finish the pressure out, right? So either way, Brezzo is going to at least see a couple more moments here in the lobby. But man, those placement points, those Elam points, just not enough. He did not do enough with himself in his trio today here for qualifying, um, you know, through week number one. Not enough to make it out of week number one, but he's the AO champ for a reason. He's still got week number two and week number three to make it out. And even then, just again, we've got to reiterate this. We've got to touch on this. Top 10 is going to automatically qualify, but there's over 100 places still up for grabs when it comes down to those consistency points. So just making it here into the round four is huge when it comes to consistency. If you stick together as a team, you make round four every single week. You are guaranteed to be making it through into those semifinal heats in OCE. So they've already got one week down. They've just Got to play consistent for week number two and week number three as well now. So Spry is setting up here around that 50 point mark. Coming into this game, top 10 was on 63 points. That was the marker. Anyone you see go down before that does not qualify. It's obviously going to jump up higher. I'm guessing more around that 70 to low 70 mark. But who's going to be up for the challenge as Basil, Vortex, and Jace were almost double above the challenge? Yeah, definitely. They're just there, just where they need to be. Here though, Sorith, folks of course in sync, looking to see if they can find some shots out here. Again, one of the teams that have been struggling with some of the Storm Surf, seems like they've been man managing it better in the later rounds, right? In the later portions of the game. 
managing to manage their storm surge and it's been kind of vicious here getting towards these last couple games it's fading out a little bit it's not kind of stacking up just as highly but they still have to worry about as this team is 18 below and this is their moment is this going to be the victory run i wanted to see more of this team as well because honestly i'm happy to admit i know very very little about them but they're making me pay attention that's what's so good about this broadcast highlighting those players you just haven't heard much of before because looking like they have a very solid chance to make it inside this top 10. They haven't gained any placement points yet. Zero placement points have been divvied out. The first one's going to go top 17. As you can see in the top left there, we're currently going into top 20 teams with 54 players alive. But you've really got to make it into that top five and especially that top three to get the big placement. Yeah, and look at that. Taker is already getting zapped now by the Storm oh, Surge no. here. So they're going to have to make some big moves. You talked about us wanting to watch them. They were just just barely above and already the scales have shifted back and forth for that trio luckily though this fight going on here means that the surge can possibly get beat for them they just have to wrap this fight up it's all going to come down to whether or not this uh player here cries finishes this or gets finished here now that'll determine if the storm surge is going to stop and whether or not uh you know the other team the lzqm and his company this trio will actually stay alive but no the longer this goes out the more likely the surge is going to be able to finish things up for other players here on the map because it is still being active right now. And here it is. He's going to swing on around. And there's oh, Taker. No. Taker, the last alive, no. already losing his teammate. I mean, the surge ends, no. but it might have been too late. The yeah, Cinderella run, I have to imagine that's not going to be enough. There was another team, District, Bantus, and Gusso's are only, they were on exactly the same amount of points as them on 11th. You had Bathan's team on 59. There's just way too many teams that were knocking at the door of that top 10 where I just don't think they're going to hold it. And Raptor, who we were just watching, also a team that was in ninth place overall, though. So looks like a few people's runs coming up just short here in the final game as other people have their sprint finish to try and make it into that top as we have Sorif, Volks, and Sink, my pick to win the whole tournament, who potentially are set up to do so just here. They're on high ground. They're in second place, only nine points behind first with Basil, Vortex, and Jace. And if they get zoned here, one second is a pull northeast. Oh, it pulls northwest, but that is definitely the advantage. And there you go. You see Sink, Volks, or Sorif just on the edge there, start to build up. They're really going to try and hold this one. And there it is. It was Volks doing the reinforcement. They have the high ground. Basil of Vortex and Jace have to play the low ground, but like I've already said today, they do it so, so well, you can't count them out. Yeah, you're talking about a nine point difference. Make that a three point difference because Damn. they've already gotten six worth of Elims already coming into this first full moving zone now. And there it is Speedy, Muzz, and Looter already on the cut through here. This is that Hydro Dam team, the one that we know has that guaranteed RPG legendary AR, so much to work with. Now, Volks on the cut here, trying to get inside. And yes, he's going to be able to secure his high ground building out, though. Is someone contesting him in front? No, that's his teammates here. But just in case, Looter, though, does turn around. They're coming around. They're trying to come up with the RPG, and that was a good shot. They're one step closer. The edit down, though. Hold up. A little bit of a reset here. What are they thinking? I'm also noticing G502 King, also known as Spryze in the feed, making that big jump up on the leaderboard. And here we have our FNCSM saying, hey, 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 you thought there was something we weren't going to make top 10 in the first week. We've got this as Remy takes down Z as well. A little bit of payback in the game. The, the poetic justice of that, the team that have put their tournament in so much shambles and still managed to find them in game number six at the very end to try to come out on top of everybody as Muzzler is feeding to try and control this low ground. Muzz having the five lashes and a really good loadout in general. They have to make their way through, but based on leaderboard, there it is. Sink, Sorif, and Volks on the high ground. Is this enough to secure the win? As Ronan takes down Worthy, though, so not only is Ronan getting a limbs in first place, they're doing it on the XFNCS champs. Yeah, definitely. Now, look at this. It's going back over the Coliseum. We talked about whether or not it was going to end here at least once a day, and it seems like it has. It's all starting to come together. It's all starting to literally fit together like a puzzle piece here. Now, Volks is going to find Jinx there, too. Ooh, that's a big one. That's an upset for Jinx for sure. Looter on the low ground, though. Already a top 10 qualification. We know they pulled through. Muzz and Speed are going to find their fourth elimination now. And they're inside the Coliseum. This is risky for them. Remember, they can't break out those walls. They're probably going to start eating some gas lines soon if they want to go up and over into the storm to get out safely. Yeah, that's the thing. Coliseum's pretty difficult. You get stuck up against those unbreakable walls. There's not many things in Fortnite you can't break. That's kind of the whole point. But the 
Coliseum as one of them is Alec trying to hold things down here for the champs, trying to go in and know the zone oh, blocks him. No. 10 HP, we're going to look in the feed and they do. Wavy Jace taken down, Wavy Alec. We got the Wavy crew up here on the leaderboard as Sync. This is going to come right down to first versus second potentially for the game and for the whole tournament. We have our first place team as a full trio on the low ground, but they're in an engagement right now as Cyrus making their way in. Cyrus takes down Jace. They need big points here as they're on 57 right now. So again, they're knocking on qualifications door. We have first place, second place. We have 11th place. All of these points matter so much, but for vastly different reasons. Yeah, no doubt about it. And here is their perspective already at six eliminations. And they're doing so, so well navigating this bottom layer so effectively. Running out of material, though, this refresh is going to mean a lot. And yes, they are going to catch Zolfer. And they're going to be able to catch him oh, no. for the loot as well. The full refresher. Another player in front. Ooh. And he does not hesitate. Ronin is sharp. He's quick. And he is cutting through these players like a hot knife through butter now. Ooh. Oh, my gosh. Ozzy is going back and forth here for the final game. It's going back and forth of the deciding factor. Looks like it's going to be Volks chopping down on the walls. That's a scary spot to be in. He's like, yeah, all right, Escher's will. You guys are controlling the low ground, but I've got things from the top down. And when Volks plays from top down, he absolutely dominates every time. That's a lot of eliminations. That's another victory out. The second of the night, the only team to get to, but wasn't enough to take out the first place. They've guaranteed qualified. They proved why I predicted them to win today, but did they manage to do it? Hey, no doubt about it. I think that is definitely enough. They had enough Elims as well. But man, talk about how many highlights players are going to be able to walk, walk away with today. That's a successful day, if you ask me. It's a successful day. And I mean, the rest of the Blobbies, the rest of the players will be, uh, you know, breathing a little bit easier. I know we didn't have the Twins playing this week, going up against their counterpart with the Volks, their ex-trio mate. I think they'll be a little bit happier knowing he's not running around in the lobby when it comes to next week, because that's a scary team. And I think they have managed to take away the dub today. And in good fashion, with two wins on the board and a really consistent amount of eliminations. Going into that game, they had over five, the highest of any other team going into this one so i think they might have this and yeah, no doubt about it i mean listen they've been putting up the big numbers this is just the start though remember there's a top 10 list somewhere out there waiting for us to know who exactly an oc is going to be able to take this home here yeah, I think that's fair. I think the analysts are going to have it for us shortly as well because it's been an exciting cast as well. Monster, your first time casting and covering OCE. Did it live up to the expectations? Did it go even beyond it, it was, what you thought? I mean, it's always listen, fun, but what did you think? Yes, it was good fun. It was good fun. It's a different pace, but it was very much still stacked games. I don't know how to explain how we had so much action, what felt yeah. like, w, like, you know, madness, but at the same time, Still, very much uh, storm surge. So, yeah. like, very weird dynamic going on here. Much different than EU, much different than NA, much different than West. So, love that every region just has a different feel here. Also. It does. Do you get your storm surge long range from positioning with ARs? Or, as Timmy keeps saying, do you get in the box? And that's what OCE does best. They take those box fights, they jump up the surge, and they keep the lobby stacked. But you just see so much action constantly. You have full teams going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and you think it's just going to clear out, but it never does. But let's see it. No, no word from us any longer. Thank you so much for tuning in with me and Monster. We're going to throw the analysts and let them cover everything. This was an absolute pleasure. I finally got to do an official broadcast from OCE. Bring it home for us, guys. Who managed to pick up the dub and who's qualified? Thank you so much, guys. Your energy was amazing. And like I said, I enjoyed it. Everyone in chat enjoyed it. The boys enjoyed it. We loved your commentary. So again, thank you for that. But as they said, we have some final thoughts on that, especially for the end game, right, Fallout? Would you like to just take it away for us and break down how that last game played out exactly? Yeah, in the end, it was the one team to take out two victory royales throughout the entirety. It was the team that Ozzy predicted to win it all. Sorif, Volks, and Sync, they end up on top with a very, very dominant uh, late game high ground finish there. But I also want to give uh, some kudos and shout to Ronan, Eshes, and Will mm -hmm. for the same way that we finished was how we started the tournament. It was actually game one that they fragged out with, I believe, a 10 to 14 alim game in game number one. They did it again with a 10 plus alim game in game number six, absolutely dominating the late game there, Timmy. Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to give a shout out to Scam, Goig, and Zorka for a really high IQ uh, play late game there, <laughs> giving up height to Sorif and, and, um, and his team, and essentially then just playing mid ground and, and looking to play off that. That's right. As we jump in to the highlights here, it was an interesting highlight. I'm not sure if we're going to catch it, but that fight over in Sweaty Sands was um, 
one to remember is an interesting one. We'll break that one down in a second as it gets there. But the Dirty Docs fight. A lot of people thought Jinx and Co. would get it for free. They've been dropping dirty and they've really conditioned most lobbies and the rest of the Oceania region to let everyone know that they own Dirty Docs, of course, with the upgradable NPC that's there. But they did get some contention at Dirty Docs and that may have contributed to their lack of top 10 potential, lack of top 10 finish there. We'll see where they end up in the standings overall, Timmy. As we know, that teams that are land contested are far less likely to place top 10 or to win a tournament at teams that land than teams that land free. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to put uh, a statement out there. Not everyone in OC decides to, to do like to, to play like this. All right. Not everyone storm fights <laughs> like this. This isn't this isn't something that's region wide. It's just um, you got you got to remember um, Jalen Zora and. Um, and Price didn't actually qualify today, so we did see someone fighting for Sweetie, which is a huge, a huge reason as to why that was fought for. And as we watch all of these, all these fights finish up here, what we did see was aggression last game, and that does happen a bit. There's a bit more clustering going on here at Coliseum, and that is to be expected. Yeah, Coliseum, especially being on the fast side of the circle, right? You're going to have teams rotating from all throughout, Pleasant, and you know, over from from the west side of the map and the like. So that's yeah. why we did see some some uh, clustering over in Coliseum, especially given it's the sand POI. You get easy rotations out of Coliseum as you need to make them. And here's one thing I want to kind of point out: Brezzo got uh, you know stuck in a pretty bad position in Storm right there, but the defending champion from Australia, the Australian Open in 2020, really the dark horse in that tournament, the first controller player to win a LAN major tournament well he didn't really show up today alongside his controller compadres i know they're making the return in their first debut <laughs> back to pc from controller fncs last season didn't necessarily work out well for them timmy no and really sad ending there to w park lzqm and takers tournaments uh, as ozzy alluded to in the yep. broadcast um as they go down before first moving could even start but it was all about height again all about height today. Uh, Sink, Sorof, and Box took it late game and then just can throw out. Little again, shout out to Jack Vortex and Basil as they make it through to the final moving zones once again. But it really was today all about high ground and how dominant it could be uh, yep. moving into late game. That's right. And this is where the Ronin show right uh, after the Ronin show ended as they had really, really solid late game. Got a couple picks. This is Will doing his best to survive, but then really easy peasy lemon squeezy from these three as they're able to collapse. Nice shot right there from Volk taking out Will. And it was a victory royale and most likely what punched their ticket into first place for that squad. Shout out to Sink, Sorif, and Co. A really, really good show from them, Vandy. Yeah, it was. Like I said, it was just so enjoyable because no match really felt the same. We had a little bit of everything today, which was really cool to see. But as you said, height was king. That was the theme of today. So we're just getting our standings ready. And like I said, I apologize if you are watching back or if you're just joining us. We didn't manage to have the leaderboard scores after each game just due to a technical issue bug. But we will have the final standings. And of course, we will find out who the top 10 to qualify are. I mean, we kind of have a little bit of an idea. I mean, Fallout, you were alluding to some as well as Aussie and Monster, but were there any surprises for today for either of you? Like big um, ones. Sorry, sorry, you, go, you go fall up. Sounds good, mate. Yeah, for me, you know, it's a little bit unfortunate to see Repulse and Co. not continue to play all the qualifier games. That was a little disappointing for me. So that was probably the biggest surprise in a, you know the first <laughs> Oceania broadcast. You would hope to see a, a full fledged kind of fair broadcast here, but we do have the standings now, Vanny. We do indeed. So here we go, our top 10. I was asking you guys for maybe who might be any upsets. It doesn't look like there really were any. So in that top uh, finish over there, Star of Hanging, Sinky, Hesh, Agent Will, Ronan, Basil. I mean, these are all names that we saw time and time again, right, Tiffy? Yeah, absolutely. And again, high ground being king. Star of uh, Vox and Sink. Two games from height, making it really easy. But the thing that I think is really important to note, uh, Sink, being one of the most experienced players in the world, knows how to play mid-ground as well. And I think that was what made the difference. He got his team to late game consistently. And then from there, if they played height, they won. If they didn't play height, they knew how to play mid-ground. So that versatility being really important. Another team to mention who was able to do that, uh, Cypher, Mark, um, Pumpkin, and Sons in fifth place there. Remember, they had that, that second place game from height. They also had that second place from mid-ground. So the versatility being really, really important. Other teams to mention, Basil, Vortex, and Jace, consistency through the mid-ground, as well as uh, Luda, Spear, Muds, making it look easy. Yeah, I want to give a particular shout out to Jake, Rax, and Skits. They're able to barely squeak in right there. You see on screen in 10th, or sorry, 9th place. Congrats to them. So it seems that I kind of 
kind of identify their teams to watch as dark horses. Jay Hazel Vortex, they make it through. They play great throughout. Jay Cracks and Skits are able to make it through, and you'll see some of the teams that didn't necessarily make it. One of the big ones, obviously, we have to talk about is King Jinx himself. Did not qualify through for the first time around, which means he can play in the further qualifiers. Keep in mind, the teams that did qualify in top 10 will not be able to play in future qualifiers, which is why I think you know we had some teams that you know they opted to, to maybe want to play in future qualifiers for practice here, Timmy. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm guessing uh, Radius, Slayer, and Fluxy are in that boat because those those guys are, are extremely consistent players. They know how to play the game. So I just, I just, yeah, that, that might be the situation there. And a little bit of a sad story with Taker, LZQ, and W Puck not quite making it into the top 10 there. But there's some other good names here. Remember Pyro, Bailey, and Spiker having hide at half half on that first game, maybe looking to, to make a name for themselves, but just falling outside of that top 10 as it came to the end. Another big mention quickly to Danith, Osiris, and Skits. I know that those guys have been working really, really hard, just falling outside of the top 10 as well. That's it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Vandy, how about you? Any surprises, anything that stuck, stuck out to you in particular? No, for me, it was a lot of just learning, I suppose, who the top teams to watch were. So I am just going to have a... A better understanding, I suppose, coming into these next few weeks of qualifiers of teams to watch. As you said, maybe ones that wanted to play in other qualifiers. And even just looking at the teams like Fresh, who we didn't get to see this week, and the Twins. So I'm very, very excited. We've got plenty more action to look out for, of course. But any final thoughts from you, gentlemen, before I start to close the show? Yeah, you know, for me, just a big shout out to Australian Open. Always puts on a great show, and I, I keep saying it, but it's truly, you know, the third year in a row now that Australian Open and Fortnite has created an amazing experience for, you know, thousands of people to enjoy. So big shout out to AO, big shout out to the Oceania region. I got a lot of love. Mm -hmm. I got my start in shoutcasting 11 years ago now, actually commentating <laughs> Australian New Zealand tournament. So it's an honor to come back. Appreciate y'all welcoming us with open arms. Much love to the Oceania community, every single one of y'all watching. Thanks for having us. And yourself, Timmy? No, Any just a big thank words? you to AO. Uh, huge congratulations to Sync, uh, Volks, and Sorof. And yeah, thanks for having me, guys. A big congratulations on your debut as well. You handled it extremely well. I mean, for anyone that didn't know, when we were talking, uh, Timmy was saying how nervous he was, and you you crushed it, as far as I can see. I just wanted Absolutely. to also do a final thank you, of course. Thank you to our casters, Aussie Antics and Monster, Fallout and Timmy for their amazing analysis, big brain analysis. Everyone watching at home, production, Australian Open, and Epic Games, thank you for this first amazing week of qualifiers. And a special thank you as well to Peking Duck and Musa. Check out Twitch chat for their socials and give them a follow. Some banging Australian tunes there. We will see you all for week two, hopefully, of qualifiers next week. Same time, same place. My name was Bandy. I was your host, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Take it easy till then. Thank you.